Thank you for tuning into the Sea Bros Fishing Podcast. On this episode, we are excited to host Ben Gahagan and Bill Hoffman from the Massachusetts Division of Marine Fisheries. Ben Gahagan is the Recreational Fisheries Program Leader at Massachusetts Division of Marine Fisheries, and his career has served on multiple jurisdictional technical committees, stock assessment teams, and has used a variety of techniques to understand the migratory movements and stock composition of fish as small as river herring and as large as Atlantic bluefin tuna. Ben is a lifelong angler and outdoorsman. He's been lucky enough to spend many hours pursuing those same fish and many other fin, furred, and feathered critters. Bill Hoffman is a senior fisheries biologist for the state where he's been working for 26 years. He manages the fisheries research and monitoring project, which includes leading a team that collects critical data, both at sea and dockside for a variety of Massachusetts commercial fisheries to support stock assessment analysis and fisheries management decisions. On the fisheries research side, Bill specializes in tagging fish using acoustic telemetry. He has conducted multiple studies focusing on questions that range from understanding basic fish migration patterns of cod and striped bass to fishery-induced mortality for striped bass, cod, cosk, and haddock. When he is not at work, he can be found out on his own boat giant bluefin tuna fishing or at a tree archery hunting for white-tailed deer on the North Shore of Massachusetts and in New Hampshire. Last fishing season, we collaborated with Ben and Bill and the rest of their team in helping them collect data for their recent efforts in analyzing post-release mortality for striped bass. In doing this, we're working towards establishing healthy release best practices for this species. Ben and Bill are developing these resources for recreational anglers that target striped bass, and they include proper fish handling upon landing, how to use circle hooks, fishing tactics, etc. In this conversation, we discussed the this research program and our fishing trips from last season. We also discuss other ongoing research projects for striped bass for several other species, including Atlantic mackerel and bluefin tuna. As always, our guests share a lot of stories. We have a ton of laughs and uh, a lot of incredible knowledge was shared in this conversation. We learned a ton from Ben and Bill in this chat, and we hope you enjoy this podcast as much as we did. Welcome to the Sea Bros Fishing Podcast, where we follow three words of wisdom. You can't catch them if you don't have a hook in the water. Always trust your instincts. And the last, you'll just have to keep listening. Stay tight. Oh, Wait until I see the, see the the does coming through this this cut, and then I just know when he shows up on my other cameras, he's gonna come through there on that doe, and I just have to be there. And I did. I called the shot. Everything went perfect. The doe went screaming by me, and he came in, and I cut a shooting lane for him, and everything. He came right into the shooting lane, and. He got his nose into it, and then all of a sudden he was like, uh, he knew something was wrong. And he sat there, and I was like full draw, just waiting for him to pop out. I th- I actually let him walk past. I had a little crease where I could have shot him, but I was waiting for him to come perfect broadside. And I'm just sitting there waiting, waiting, waiting. And then all of a sudden you could tell. And it was like one of those days that was warm, but it wasn't like there was no wind. And so I knew my scent was starting to like drop. Yeah, yeah yep. I'm like I'm in trouble. And sure enough, he looked up and he picked me off in the tree. And he and I were just staring at each other for like five minutes. And he was just like, he's like, do I go left? Do I go right? And I'm like, do I try to shoot? I can't. I got bushes. And so finally, he just like jumped. And uh, that was it. That's so cool. And you didn't see him again after that? I did. Oh, you did. So he came back on December 5th. He came back. And I got him on my cameras again. And this was the most exciting, the most exciting day. Um one of the most exciting I've ever had in my life, deer hunting. I went in early, first morning, got in like two hours early, waiting. I knew he was in there with a doe because I had him on the night before on my cameras. And uh, he started, you know, whatever, came down through the hill. And, um, man, I watched him come down. I, I'm sitting across this little beaver marshy thing, and I'm looking up this whole hillside, and it's all like real high stem count stuff and brushy stuff. So I can see in through all of it. And I watched him 
for about four hours, breed a doe. He fought, he had two satellite box fighting him. Eventually came down nose to nose with a coyote. The coyote actually pushed his doe off, so he took off. And this thing is, I gotta, I'll show you the picture. It's like this. And he came, and then, so he took off, and he, he they finally laid down midday and kind of laid down. And then our boss sends me a text. He's like, emergency meeting. This, <laughs> I don't care what you're doing. You got to be there. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. So I got down out of the tree, drive to cell phone range where I had a signal. And then I did the meeting. And then this is when I should have taken the page out of your book because this is what I, I almost did. Because the way the wind was, I knew where he was. And if I belly crawled in, he was going to come back out and I would have had him on the ground. But I was like, I thought it was too risky. And I just, I got back in that same tree thinking that he'd do the same thing he did before through that pinch point. And so he eventually he came down and he stood exactly where I thought he was going to sit, where I would have shot him off the ground. And then he had that other buck coming in behind him. He takes off, fights that buck, comes back down. The doe goes by me and I'm like, here we go. And he came in, and again, at 30 yards, he just sat there, and he knew something was up, and I just watched him, and then the sun just, he just oh, disappeared in the my darkness. God. And I heard him walk by me in the dark, and uh, there's not that I could do about that's it. That's awesome, yeah. though. It was what amazing. a freaking learning experience. I'll show you a picture of this deer. It's amazing. While you're pulling that up, can you guys, definitely you just scoot like the tiniest bit this way if you can, and just be a little better at the camera. And then mic-wise, just try to keep it like a fist or two. It doesn't need to be okay. perfect, but like, don't you know, totally watch back. Got it. Um, and like we said, if we say anything, you can just say in the moment, be like, I don't know if I want that in there. George will pick it up and can do an edit or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, so George obviously edit this out. Um, that's sick. Yeah, it was, um, it was a great hunt. And then I had other other deer and other hunts where I got into deer and I saw them, but you know, never had a shot. That kind of stuff. And a lot of cruisers. Yeah. But that, that was my number one deer. It was fifteen points, and it was like it was Jesus, big, mature, Jesus. like four and a half year old. Is he still alive? Do you make it through the season? We'll see. I haven't seen him since the fifth. Him. Yeah, I'm a little nervous. But this yeah. is a spot where it's kind of like this around here, where there's a lot of big bucks in the neighborhood. They don't live on my property. Yeah. Um, I've got the does. Yeah. And I'm very like limited what I can do is conservation land. So I have to be very careful. Um, so I can't really like manipulate the landscape and put in kill plots and stuff like that. Yeah. So it's just uh, hunting the fringes of it and popping in here and there. Yeah. It's, it's a nice spot. Um, ben duck hunts there. I, uh, I, I have a canoe stash so I can paddle into the back, which is really stealthy, which That's is sweet, really fun. But it's, you know, obviously like any spot, it's wind dependent. Are you doing any of those canoe hunts in the morning, like all day sits or are you pretty That's much? That's the best. Yeah. That's my favorite. I killed a 145 inch deer out of there. Um, and that was last year. They've, yeah. Out of the same spot, but in the back. And that's what I did. I got up at like 2 a.m. and I paddled in. And I got in and sat up in the, I mean, it takes me over an hour to get in there. It's, it's, a, it's a little bit of a chore. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that's exactly what happened. It was just one of those things. I made a mock scrape. He was hitting it. And I just knew I had pictures of him about two days before. And I knew that if he's going to come in, he's going to come in through this spot. And that's what I did. When you're making mock scrapes, are you doing like uh, buck and doe scent and kind of like making it a shooting scrape or are you trying to make like buck scrapes and doe scrapes in and around the same areas? I do one scrape typically with a good looking branch above it. Yeah. And then, um, I use this stuff. It's, it's actual, actual like deer scent. So you have the tarsal gland, yep. um, and the, uh, orbital gland and I'll put that stuff on it. And usually, honestly, if I'll go in early, like I'll try See, I don't like going in too close to the hunting season, but I don't hunt the first of October because I'm always too inefficient. So. Yeah. So I'll go in, in, in October, I'll touch up the scrapes. And as long as a doe or a buck, doesn't matter what it is, as long as they hit it once, that's about it. Then that's usually that's it. They'll it's, start to take, they'll just start keeping their own scent on it. And yeah. if it's in the right place, so this is an edge. So this is the edge of a swamp and a, yeah, beaver pond. So it's like a nice travel corridor. So if you can get it on the travel corridor, as soon as they start hitting it, usually that's all it is. And then sometimes I'll lay them down. I'm like, this is the most perfect spot. And they just they never take them. Yeah. I just can't get them to hit it. 
Interesting. Yeah. I love this shit. I know. Oh, God. <laughs> it's bad. Like, we could do a whole podcast just hunting. Season. Sounds like we need to at some point. Yeah. <laughs> How is your hunting season, man? I, um, I'm going crazy right now because <laughs> I'm trying to finish my PhD, and I actually did not hunt. This oh god all i like I, I and so you're ready to crawl built, out of your own skin yeah, yeah basically <laughs> and, and so like I, I i've had this terrible reverse arc of things where i i didn't have kids until like my mid-30s and uh and so uh you know through my late 20s and early 30s i was probably between waterfowl and deer hunting getting like 60 65 hunts a year in in the fall and it's just as I've had more ki kids and other things happen, it's just going down, down, down. And then, yeah, I really need to finish my PhD, um, which I'm sure we'll talk about some of the straight bass stuff I'm doing today. But uh, oh, God. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Riley, that, that's great, man. Good stuff. <laughs> um, so it yeah, be I'm fine. sure we'll get into some of that. But uh, I, I like Bill, I very high passion level for fishing and hunting. Uh, but I, I, got, I got. you know, kind of met the rubber met the road this year. And I went tuna fishing all summer yeah. and into the fall and, and said, all right, I'm not going to deer hunt or really I, went, I think i went waterfowling three times and i that was great i get to scratch that itch but uh did you yeah. get a lot of tuna fishing in though as much as i can like i mean really with my schedule at work and then having kids it's like 12 to 13 14 times a day a year like yeah that's like that's what we, i get in and yeah so i got enough it's in. a solid solid season for picking away at it for sure yeah 15 trips yeah 14 we're, 15 trips yeah we almost buddy boat we're always fishing the same if we always fish about the same amount of days i get out a little bit more than you maybe yeah you probably get a few more days and than i do and some of mine you get like full days and i like drop the kids off at school at eight and then like run to my boat and so i get out late <laughs> but it's good to be out there i'll be like all right bill where's the bait what's going on <laughs> but yeah so um yeah we get, i get that that much time in and it was good um it's always good and you know uh my tuna fishing started out in the canyons because I lived in Southeast Connecticut. So we'd go out to like the dip, uh, West Atlantis block, all that kind of stuff. Um, nice. and that's how I started tuna fishing. And then when I moved up here, I started bluefin fishing with Bill cause he was doing it at that point. And then after a couple of years got lucky and kind of lucked in uh, actually Jay Goodwin's old boat. Oh yeah. 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 Sick. Um, it was a stagger he had for like two years, three nice. years. And, and so, uh, so yeah, so I have that boat and it's, just an, those things are beasts i love my stagger i really really love my stagger i think i was talking to ben about it yeah he loves it, those things i bill's bit thought mine's good and i i really like it yeah um, it's I, a nice setup yeah i fished on a similar size parker when i was going out to the canyons it wasn't on a big boat it was on a 28 foot parker so i was picking your weather days and everything like that but uh I like the stagger more. I don't think you could pay me enough money to go out to the canyons on a boat like that anymore. <laughs> it, it, I think it would. Well, we're, we're going to do it. You want to come with us? <laughs> I know you have I'll much watch. better rides to the canyons. I just want the report. I hope it's safe. But yeah. I just want the report. Oh, yeah. No. I, I, yeah, so I'm repowering uh, this winter. So oh, the report and the flight plan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, no. Oh. So yeah, that but yeah, that was that was my experience was getting into tuna was it was it was like you always you just had to be really picky about the weather windows because it was just a small boat. Yeah. You know? But it's a good boat for where we fish out. We so we run oh. out of Plum Island Sound, so we have to deal like sandbars and stuff like that. And summer's not bad, but when you get the hurricane swells, those big ground swells, it gets really dicey. That I mean, I've been out in a lot of bad weather and commercial fishing. Um and then but one of the hairiest moments I ever had was on my boat. When I was going out, it was October. I was going out by myself. I like to fish solo a lot. I have a smaller boat. And uh, we went out, and, or I went out solo, and it was 3 a.m. And I left the house, and I could hear the rollers on the beach. And I didn't think it was going to be that bad. And I was, I, it just didn't even really occur to me. I was like, wow, that's kind of strange. You can, must be the way the wind's blowing today or something. And I go, and I'm just bombing along. And I look up at my radar. I'm coming through the cut, and I just see, like, yellow just everywhere yellow i'm like what the heck next thing i know i'm just like i'm it was like a almost uh it was like a sliver of a moon and next thing i know i'm looking directly at the moon and i'm just like absolutely qualified captain <laughs> airport <laughs> <laughs> oh no this is not good and then and then the thing is was, i landed it fine but then i'm looking up and i just see white water ahead of me rollers and at that point you can't turn around yeah. You're just like i gotta just power through it and so i did and i got through and uh, I got out and it was an amazing day. I, I didn't get one that day, but I remember hearing later that afternoon, a lobster boat was going back into the Merrimack and rolled. So it was, wow. a, it was a big swell. Yeah, wow. It's pretty dicey. So it's, it's shallow, but 
you know, Ben's boat and my boat, we got outboards and because that's what works for that spot the best. Yeah. Yeah. Works well. Yeah. What and they're fishing. What territories do you guys fish mostly for bluefin? Like what areas? So I, I'll fish all the way up to mud hole. Um, I have gone up to the fingers for small fish, but mm-hmm. I don't do that. For giants, I'll definitely go. Basically, it's mud hole, curl. We, all all Jaffrey's, um, Pigeon Hill, Southern, all that stuff is, that's where I put as much time as I can. But then we make the run down to the bank a lot. It's so good down there. Yeah. We love that Western edge and all the way down the shipping lanes. Typically is about as far down and all the high ground stuff. And, but that's, that's my world right there. And cool. yeah. usually it's enough. Some good bottom. Yeah. 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 Special place. What about you? Same. I mean, same areas. The same thing. Like a lot of times we're buddy boating. We, okay. We've got the cool kid radios now. So yeah. We can talk yeah, on the radio and say whatever we want. Yeah, and uh, so it's fun. So we and it's nice. I mean, you guys know you have a great network. So it's it's just so you know we can be a mile apart, and sometimes that makes all the difference to be talking about what you're seeing yeah, in one yeah. spot than another, and exactly what you're getting for bait and everything else. Yeah, uh, it's a hundred percent. Like I've I've I I'm self taught. I've never been tuna fishing with another person, but I have friends that tuna fish, and I've been out with a lot of commercial guys you know other ground other fisheries but we talk about tuna all day and but so i just kind of figure it out and I, that's what i've done over the last 10 15 years now but you can like know how to rig a perfect bait or stick bait or all these tricks and stuff but really it's just, it's your network really it's is. just being in you got to know where the fish put a went. fish on the hook mm-hmm. yeah yeah yeah, and it's fun, you know, because these are, I, you know, I learned things fishing the canyons, and then Bill and I fished together for a couple of years on his boat, and so we kind of had the same method for bluefin fishing because I picked up a lot of the bluefin stuff he was doing, but now I'm fishing on my boat, and we're both kind of like growing that different ways and yeah. come back together and you know just have talks and about like all right wait, wait you're hooking your fish that way now like wait what you're doing this? like what are you doing and like so it's cool to be able to like. If I think that we both benefit from the way where the other person is experimenting and yeah. we'll be like, wait a second, how did you get that bite? You did, you're doing what now? Like, and, and so it's neat to be able to do that. You have different too. styles. We still do that. Really? Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. All the time. As many days we're like, we have no idea what we're doing. Yeah. But dude, <laughs> you would not believe this. <laughs> you tried what? Yeah. You did what? So, so bring us through how you got to where you guys are now, as far as fisheries. It's really cool to, to talk to people that are in, you know, fisheries management research and things that really, you know, are obsessed with fishing. So, you know, I mean, I'm sure you guys at some level love what you do. Um, maybe you wish you was a little more of tuna focus, but. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, no, I think that we're. Yeah. Striped bass are just as cool. No, straight bass are very cool. Straight bass are very, very cool. Yeah. Um, you want to go first? You want me to? I'll go for sure. So, um, so I went to school down at Roger Williams, and uh, and honestly, I could have gone into wildlife ecology or marine biology when I went to college. I was undecided. I just knew that this was the field, general, you know, biology, and then. At a, after fresh out of college, I got a my first job was a, a federal fisheries observer. And, um, I did that for three years and it, the turnover in that, in that line of work is like six months, if not less. I mean, people just don't last cause it's hard. You're living out of a duffel bag. You're not always wanted on these boats. And then the work environment, I mean, your commercial fishing, I did everything. I did some awesome fisheries. I, I see sampled on, um, the drift gillnet fishery. I went out with, the uh, the Mayus out of, um, Menemsha and we went out to the, out to the canyons and drift gill for swordfish that was amazing that's wild it, oh it was i didn't even know they did that experimental fishery yeah and they shut it down because of the marine mammal bycatch but they okay. were trying to see if they could do it cleanly yep. because it's it's size the meshes are very selective on the size um swordfish that you catch so like when i see the long line fish being landed i look at those i'm like man those are tiny these guys were catching like you know three four five six hundred pounds every single one it was just these giant wow. swordfish yeah and that's all they caught it was really cool, but, um, but they couldn't make that work, unfortunately. And then, um, but anyway, so I did a lot of that and then, um, and then I got an opportunity to do the same thing at the state level. And so, um, and that's, that's when I moved over to the state. And I guess the reason why I was like, 
observer for so long and why I liked it is because of my passion for fishing. That's the only way you can do that job. I mean, cause it sucks. It's hard. It's it, lots of times it's miserable. And, it, but the thing is, I just liked being, I just liked seeing what came up on the hook or came up in the net every time. And, yeah. um, and then just literally being like waist deep in fish and then, you know, and then there's a the science end of it. I was really intrigued and interested in that. And I've always been in, interested in proper, you know, management of resources and, and the biology of the animal. So, I mean, like we were just talking about deer hunting, but that's why one of the, the thing I like the most about deer hunting is just that I like studying the animal. I don't care about the gear or, I mean, I do, but to me, a gun is just a tool. It's no different than a fishing pole. I don't really, right. I'm not a gun guy, but I have them and I use them cause that's my tool. And it's the same thing, like the biology of the fish always kept me, um, you know, intrigued. So then I worked for the state and I've been now here for like 26 years or something. Jesus. Yeah, I've been there a long time. It was my really first real big job and um, I feel really fortunate to have it. It's like, it's a lot of fun. Um, so yeah, I started doing that and then I was an observer for the state for a little bit while, for a while. Um, eventually I start, I took over the um, sea sampling, port sampling program. So we're collecting, working with commercial fishermen at sea, shoreside, to collect information to support management and, and assessments and biology. Um, but also given my interests, I naturally fell into fisheries research. And so um, I ran, I did a lot of stuff running like um, trawl surveys. So um, I ran um, more recently, I ran one um, out of Situ on the Miss Emily. We did a cod survey, but about uh, 10 years prior to that, I did another one that was a lot bigger. It was from the Canadian border all the down, way down to Chatham, Massachusetts. We had four big commercial trawlers that we, we chartered out, and um, we were looking at spatial distribution of, of cod. Um, and, uh, and then there was other groundfish species, but cod was the primary focus of that. Um, yeah. And then, so that was some of the got started to kind of get away from like the sea sampling, port sampling to now into more dedicated research. And then, and we'll, we'll get down into it then getting into the striped bass research. Um, and really discard mortality has been like the thing that I've been really working on a lot lately. And that's with, um, using acoustic telemetry. And so in, uh, 2006, 2006, we started investing as a state into this acoustic telemetry technology that we'll talk more about. Yeah. And um, I assuming it's similar to the bluefin stuff we were doing when you, you yeah. put yeah. the acoustic tags Slightly and then you follow them and make sure they're alive. Yeah. 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 So it's, yeah. post risk mortality. Um, it's a different, just different equipment. I think they're using sat tags. You I guys assume. are using pop-up sat We're using tags. acoustic tags oh, yeah. DEI and they'd follow them for several miles yeah. to make sure that they survived uh, okay. after we swam them gotcha to, to make sure like swimming them, study yeah you, know, you know kept them alive i guess yeah yeah so yeah and so we got invested in that and um yeah and then really i mean I, me and and ben and then micah dean works with us and mike armstrong the four of us um we've really taken on a lot of these projects and we've collaborated with umass and new england aquarium stuff and I think at this point we're like one of the specialists in the field, I'd say, for for using acoustic telemetry to study the post-release mortality, hmm. at least up here on the East Coast. Yeah, I'd agree. I would definitely, I wanted to like interrupt you at the time, but it's like, I think that the whole, like what you guys are talking about with the deer and ducks and everything, it's like, that is the motivating factor, right? For right. everything. It's yeah. just like trying to figure out the animal. I mean, that's what makes it really cool. And I think it's, Bill and I are lucky that we talk about it a lot, how lucky we are that we get to do it. We have all these hobbies. We do it and we go out and we go fishing and we go deer hunting and everything else. Bill used to be a, a big waterfowler. I can't drag him back into it. He refuses. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I always say, like, come January 1st, I was like, you want to go duck hunting? <laughs> you can't deer hunt anymore. You go? Um, but uh, he never takes me up on it. I haven't, go I haven't gone duck hunting yet. I'm a little offended. I told Ben I would take him, and he never got in touch with me. Yeah, Ben kind of goes Ben in the winter and does his thing. But yeah, he was he was making a lot of noise about how he wanted to try goose hunting. Yeah, I'd like to give it a rip. It's fun. Ben will do any hunting. Yeah, yeah. Goose hunting's fun. They like the ducks are awesome. I like and like they're way better eating. But like I goose, I think everybody would tell you that generally on any given day, geese are more responsive to calling. Yeah. And that's what makes it fun is that like all of a sudden you can really like talk do something and, cool. like, and like influence what they're going to do when you, yeah. once you get good enough to understand what they're saying, what they're looking for and, and what's going on. And all of a sudden you can like just turn a flock of geese on a dime and get them 
fired up when you figure out what they want to hear and just be like, all right, here they come. Like That's wild. I can put this call down and just like yeah. not even touch it because I got them now. The whole, the whole interacting with animals in the wild is amazing. It's honestly, I think, I mean, I haven't been hunting nearly as long as both of you have, but the, but those interactions and those experiences that I've had in the last couple of years stand out from, you know, actually taking an animal or anything like that. It's unbelievable. I, yeah. And you can say this for tuna fishing. You can say this for deer hunting. It's like when you are playing on their terms and you can fake them out, you can predict their movements and make that call. Say if I said, you know, like reading that spot, that funnel that I shot that big buck out of a couple years ago and I didn't get the one out of this year. I, I called that shot and just to do it, I didn't get it, but it was almost just as good. Like yeah. I outsmarted. I knew where it was going to be. I predicted it. So cool. Yeah. Really nice when that yeah. works out. Yeah. There's I, nothing more satisfying. I'm still not there with the tunas though. Because some people be like, oh, the wind's coming from the south. If you're in the bay, you got to be down down this end and over here. And I'm like, how does they, how do they know that? Like, I haven't figured that part out yet. And then you have to stand on the roof and just tell dirty jokes all day and that's what, that's what calls them in <laughs> the winds out of the south and you're like i'm going south they're going to be down there in the bites of the north and you're like what did i just do <laughs> that was a terrible choice <laughs> was, uh, how about how about your background into all this oh man my back so i have like a way more circular long road route than bill where he kind of like went to a school where that was a good you know they had a program for it and he knew that's what he wanted to do i grew up like absolutely fishing nuts i was like kid it'd, it'd be like a thunderstorm in the summer, and I'd be Same. up my dad's butt to be like, let's go largemouth fishing. Like, the second is over. Like, we got to go largemouth fishing. You're taking me to the pond. Like, we're going. It's awesome. Um, and then, uh, so I grew up in southeast Connecticut and uh, right at the mouth of the Connecticut River in Long Island Sound. So it was cool because I had really good freshwater and river and Long Island Sound fisheries going on there and kind of just tracked through everything and started saltwater fishing a lot. But didn't really know in, in any real way that this was an option as a career until – after college, I got a history degree in college. Uh, I thought I was going to be a teacher. It didn't uh, end up happening. And I, I moved down to Texas for a couple of years, had a lot of fun, came back, was looking for jobs and got a job as a seasonal doing fishery stuff. And after like three weeks, I was like, oh, this is exactly what I want to do. It's cool. Yeah. So went to um, went to graduate school at UConn. And then I was working for a few years. And, uh, and again, Bill's more like commercial marine based. I was doing, and I think I initially reached out to you guys about shad and river herring. So right. I, I did my master's on river herring. Uh, so I was working with diadromous fish uh, from the start, from starting like 2004, 2005. And then, uh, so I was doing river herring in Connecticut for my master's, went down and worked for a really influential professor, uh, doctor out of University of Maryland, who's done a ton of straight bass work and bluefin tuna work. And I got a chance to do um, the bluefin tuna project down there where uh, we sampled the recreational and commercial fisheries in the winter on the Outer Banks, which is really cool. That was a really cool experience to go down there in like February and March into early April, Hatteras, Oregon Inlet, and all yeah. that kind of stuff. And see it's the a fish cool coming spot. in. Really cool spot. Um, talk to all the anglers. And uh, just to do such a different culture down there and get a taste of that. But, um, and that was neat. You know, I'd been canyon fishing for a while there and we'd gotten one bluefin out in the canyons, but I hadn't had a lot of bluefin exposure. I actually have, um, I do like a really hack job of tails. You guys do the really nice job, but I, I, I figured out something. That's our old one. The new one, new ones are yeah, down that, yeah. so, so mine look like that. They look yeah. like the old ones, but like, yeah. I, I like doing it myself. I like, it's cool for me to like, I'm part of hunting and fishing for me is like just closing the circle and having some type of like really fake, but like feeling of self-sufficiency. Totally. And like yeah, everything like, and it's like a very modern world and we're not self-sufficient, but I try and like lie to myself a little bit be like, yeah, I killed this animal and I brought it and processed it. And it for, brings like, like complete yeah. closure to it for me. Yeah. You know? I really like that part. Yeah. Of it. I love cooking and I love cooking the animals and like figuring out ways to use it. Um, but yeah, so I do the tails, but I have the, I don't know if it still is at the time it was a recreational record for North Carolina. Wow. Yeah. So like I saw that it got landed on the internet and it was landed at one of the harbors where I was like, I had made relationships with the, uh, the people who processed all the animals there. So that I knew it would be waiting for me. And I got down there and it was like, I think it was 810 pounds. So wow. it's a pretty big one. Yeah. Um, and uh, and it got down there and I walk into the cooler and the big walk-in cooler. And I'm like, the tail's still there. <laughs> like they just left. They didn't take the tail, like the head and the tail. It was like, the, and like when I called the guy, he's like, yeah, you guys, he's like, I got that fish and I have like 10 more fish for you. But the, you know, the 
this is like the life my life at the time i call these guys be like what do you got and they'll be like yeah they're i got all these fish and you know the the uh the dump truck's coming tomorrow so you need to be here in the next eight hours and i just drive like six hours straight from maryland down to <laughs> north carolina to like load up my truck hit three three places and like load up a truck with 25 or 30 heads and then you know either work on them i became really good friends with an awesome guy in hatteras and he'd let me use their their cutting tables and like work up fish there or i just drive back to maryland with like a truck tahoe full of bloody heads were you doing the odalith yeah on? doing odalith stuff odalith microchemistry to figure out if they're med or uh gulf of mexico fish yeah yeah so it was really cool um it was a neat project um but i got that tail out of it which was also really cool so i have that um in my house along with some of the fish i've caught um but yes yeah, so i was doing that i was doing striped bass work acoustic telemetry work in the hudson river and so then I got the job in Massachusetts and Bill and uh, Micah Dean, who wasn't, you know, we didn't bring him today, but he's amazing and uh, a big part of everything we do. Mike came on one of the trips, didn't he? Mike, uh, did Mike? Micah? No, uh, Matt did. Matt, okay. Yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, Matt came uh, and Joe. Gotcha. Who works for Bill and I. Um, so, uh, yeah, Micah, he has a couple, he has three children and um, is a great angler and a, an incredible scientist, really great data, data analyst. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's hard for him to break away break and get in the field at this point. Busy, busy. Busy, busy, yeah. yeah. But um, yeah, so anyways, ended up at DMF and Bill and I and Micah would sit and talk in the hall about this kind of stuff and start dreaming up crazy projects. And one of the really cool things, I think that, again, trying to get people to understand what... Um, what we do at DMF is like, we try to be really responsive to what we're seeing on the water and what we're hearing from people who are on the water all the time, whether, they, whether they're recreational charter or commercial anglers and fishermen, like we want to know what's going on. And we, and I think kind of unique to state agencies on the East coast, like if there's something we can do, we try to do it, which is why we did the project with you guys. That's why we doing some of the other striped bass and the cod research. There's not a lot of state agencies that would, there's no state agency that really, that would be like, we're going to do an independent four boat commercial industry based survey. Ma Mass DMF's the only one that would do that. Yeah. I think yeah. like, it, so much, we, yeah. we, we tackle a lot of things that other agencies wouldn't. So it's been a really, you know, I came from more of an academic and research background. And one of the reasons I've stayed at DMF is because it's, we, the allowance of the yeah, project. we get to actually do that. You think some of that has to do with just the like generational history of fishing in our area, and just like the program is built up and the buy-in is there, or what do you think drives that? I think that um, I think that's part of it. I think that um, you know the the still having strong at least some commercial fisheries helps a lot as opposed to some of the other smaller new england states that have less i think it's also because of our leadership yeah so i was gonna say our, our, mike armstrong has been really supportive and he actually he had the vision like when i first started before ben was here um this was very different model than what dmf had and it was like we do statistics and collect you know license information and like it was very elementary and then what we would do and then mike came in and he came from an academic background and so he had this vision of like actually like when we're when there's like a board like a striped bass board in the asmfc whatever like almost nine times out of ten and all these boards were like really involved if not leading chair like and that's how way he wanted to be he's like we want to be contributing not only to the science or to the management to the science and then above him the director so at that time was paul diodati he was a great big picture guy so he went out and was like okay he supported that concept he went out and bought us boats we have a 28 foot um, bhm right now and um, we have a uh, south shore 38 foot south shore lobster boat that i mean i get to run those boats a lot and um just awesome tool for our stuff like other states do have boats but um we use it a lot for just like for this research and so i think it was their vision that gave us the opportunity and then we, we were able to um you know use our skills our knowledge and then we were very successful at securing grant so we bring a lot of soft money in through sk grants or whatever um and so um, you know, B-Rep grants. So these different grants just bring in, they're like sizable grants. I mean, we're, some of them are like 250,000. Now they're going up to like $300,000 and we can get a, a good science for that. Yeah. So. Yeah. But and we're also willing to DMF's willing under Mike and Paul and now Mike and, and, uh, Dan McKeon and they will like, if they think it's important enough, they'll find the funding too. So one of the projects we can talk about with striped bass, it really, Bill, Mike and I dreamed it up, wrote it up. We're like, we'll try and go get grant money 
and we brought it to Mike and said, this is what we want to go get grant money for. And he, he, you know, we presented our idea and he was just like, I want you to do it. I want you to do it bigger and we're going to pay for it. Hmm. And so wow. it is really cool to have, it's amazing to have that kind of support to be yeah, able to go and good. do that. I mean, that was a really large project, five year hmm. project with, you know, where, where we're putting out like 70 receivers every year for that one. Yeah. Yeah. The first one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that was a crazy array. That was, but, oh my God. <laughs> so we got into, we got these, so, okay, like acoustic telemetry, everybody pretty much has an idea how it works. But basically, um, you have um, acoustic, the tag is an acoustic transmitter. It's about this little bit bigger, maybe a AA battery. And each tag has a unique ID with it. So acoustically, it pings this out and it's a unique ID and associated with it can be like sensor information, like depth or temperature or acceleration, which is helpful for post-release mortality. Mm -hmm. um, and then that communicates to a receiver, a listening device. So it's always going. And right. Yeah. And so it's like as a fish, it's kind of like a really, I, I call it, I think of it like easy pass. So like if you're going through the toll booth and all of a sudden you ping your easy pass to the toll booth and it knows who you are, that's what it's like. Mm -hmm. um, so, and so, uh, yeah, so to do that, so we put that out and then um, in, in the studies, then we'll put an array of these receivers wherever our study area is. So in this case, this is the first time we really got involved. Um, <laughs> we put in... 20 it was it 2006 um you guys probably remember there was like a ton of striped bass up on the bank feeding on sand yes yeah, like mm -hmm. insane in you could yeah, yeah. it was we were nuts. catching them on squid bars like it was nuts yeah. yeah yeah and they were everywhere and everybody wanted to go catch him and and the feds were like nope can't fish in the ez and so we we're like well i wonder if if this is like this refugium for striped bass or if they actually are coming in and they're being um if they're subject to mortality associated with recreational fishing or the commercial fishing fleet. So I put receivers from the tip of Cape Ann. I put one line going all the way out nine miles over Southern. And then I went all the way down to tip Cape Ann, all the way down to like almost Plymouth, down the state line. And so if those, and then we tagged fish out on the Northwest corner and some down to the Southeast corner. And then if those fish came into state waters and did pass the toll booth, boom, we'd pick them up. I put, I put like 13 of them off of the race and uh, thinking that they would go also maybe from Southeast corner down into Cape Cod Bay, which everybody says, of course they do. Right. And uh, man, that is a, not a good place to put a receiver. I'll tell you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Zero. The fir first time I, no, I lost my shirt. Those things are like, oh, yeah. at the time they were probably like 1200 bucks each. And I was like, <laughs> yeah. I was losing them. So I quickly had to rethink that one. And, uh, after I lost like half my receivers, <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't a strong start, but that's how I became, you know, good at it. You yeah. learn from your mistakes. You gotta learn. Um, so yeah, that's how we kind of got into it. And then our, we capitalize off of our knowledge, I think. And every year we've built off of that early study, um, which kind of leads into some of the stuff that you started working on. I, We'll maybe start in with some of the striped bass stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So um, so that was the first study we ever did. And then after, we, we tag, end up tagging about 300 fish out on the bank. And um, one of the advantages, I think, um, the using this, acoustic, this system, acoustic telemetry, is that not only are the tags I'm putting in the water getting picked up by my receivers, but anybody else that's doing the same type of work can pick up my tag. And we have this thing called um, the ACT. Um, that it's just a group of scientists and um, and academics that share information. So if I pick up something, I'll put it this. I'll put this information into this database, and then they can get that data out of it. And likewise, so it worked out really well. Up and down the East Coast at that time, there was a lot of telemetry studies going on, even more now. But um, and we had receivers um, all down through Massachusetts. Uh, all the way down um, New Jersey, Rhode Island at the time didn't have too many, or Connecticut. We had some in Connecticut, um, Tom Savoy, um, yep. And then it went down into like, all the way down into like these, the spawning grounds of first striped bass. So these are these natal rivers where they go to spawn. Um, and so as you guys know, the primary spawning areas are the Chesapeake, the Delaware, and the Hudson. Mm -hmm. And so based on the telemetry, um, information that we, we got through this network, we could actually start to get an idea of exactly where our fish are coming from. So previously back in the 70s and 80s, there was like tagging studies done that said one study, 
um, was it Fabrizio said that it was like a hundred percent were Chesapeake fish. And wow. we were like, I don't know if that's right. I mean, it was an older study. Yeah. Um, and then they, someone in the eighties did that and it was like a more of a split. Um, and then, and then after we did it, we came up with a, a lot more accurate estimate and it was like 60 to 70 percent we figured was coming out of the chesapeake um and then the rest primarily out of the hudson the chesapeake delaware was pretty much the same we kind of lumped that together um and so but we did get some really cool um you know movement patterns too so like when i did it i sealed off the canal i put two receivers on the south and just gonna ask this east. yeah yeah oh man the canal is fascinating mm -hmm. yeah so isn't like, the canal like 80 percent of their migration now is that true well i don't know about 80 percent, but we get it yeah so in when i did it like in the spring um we had up to 75 percent of all the fish that i tagged on the bank came up through the canal but what's interesting is that um they don't spend a lot of time in the canal now more recently in the last several years when all those mackerel are piled up yeah they hung out there because they're mm -hmm. feeding on the mackerel yeah but when they're migrating they blow right through yeah so i could actually look at when they entered the canal one end and see them leave and in, in non-real time i didn't know like i don't know like today the bass are here yeah we had to go download the receivers to get the data that's probably a good thing How yeah many it's probably it's good. <laughs> was there like an average time spent in there yep three hours three hours yep. Which yeah which is like basically how fast the boat goes through it, that's they're exactly. ripping through there. Yeah. They're they're riding that tide, yeah. and they're probably not working hard. I mean, I don't know, but I imagine they're staging up and waiting for that tide to let go, yeah, and then. Just, I would say so. Yeah, I wonder if they're going with the tide or against the tide. With it, I'm assuming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They it's, are it, they do they typically travel with the tide and then they feed against the tide? I, we can't get that granularity of data out of it. We can't get, like get that fine with it. But yeah. I um I haven't looked at I have a ton of data I have to look at on a finer scale. I've done really broad stuff and we can move into that study but when i've looked in rivers like you can see them turn with the tide like after spawning striped bass shad river herring and like they'll just go and be gone like yeah. they just go with the tide and they just yeah. go with that flow and they fly yeah um so that's yeah, definitely the case with yeah. that um Three so hours wow that's crazy. i mean i'm thinking about all the canal pastors just to go to the canyons and like they almost all are an hour and a half yeah yeah Right. Yeah. So that was really cool. So we saw some really cool movement stuff like that. And then we also saw that the majority of the fish um, in the fall would go down the backside. They wouldn't use the canal for, yeah. for migration. And that was also in part because that's where the sand deals were. Like during those times, it was like we had tons of sand deals yeah, up on food. the bank. Yep. And then the, that sand deal body of fish would slide down the backside. The commercial fish would set up on them. They whacked them pretty good. And then the fish stayed on those and then they'd slide south. So, but my work using that method although it was great at the time it was coarse compared to some of the stuff that ben was working on so i don't want to talk too much about your thing so you know no, it's well, a nice transition yeah though. well i mean so really a piggyback you know bill had done that i had been working in the hudson and we were talking about all these different things because there's so many there are cool places like the canal where you see these really amazing behaviors for me i was um you know i was managing an array in the hudson river that was going up from uh basically above the Bear Mountain Bridge down through the mouth, like out into the like out into the ocean, and to so at that point now now everything with this database you just load your stuff in and it automatically gets out. At that point you like you download your file your receiver files and have to like pick through an Excel file, being like, all right, whose tag is this? What was it? Like you so you could actually like see what it all was. Yep. And uh, we had receivers down at uh, the Verrazano Bridge, like at below the mouth of the harbor. And in the fall, like just the biomass of fish from everywhere that would move through there, it was fascinating. Just like every different species from tagged in Maine to North Carolina, just like wow. showing up at the mouth of the Hudson. And I mean, it's just got shad and river herring and food, you know, all sport, Menhaden, everything's just pouring out of there. And, mm -hmm. and it was just like one of these scenes where you're like, like October, like this is the place. Yeah. Like everything's there. It was really cool to see that. We're talking about the kind of things you see with this. So we came up with this other project and kind of built on Bill's experience and learning all the things he'd learned. Losing receivers. Yeah, losing receivers. We did a good job losing receivers still. It was fine. Um, I'm getting better. I'm getting better. <laughs> You're getting very good. But like we uh we got we got we we dreamed big and um so we were interested, you know, so he tagged fish just out on the bank. And um we were really interested about striped bass throughout Massachusetts. So we took these receivers and we gated off from the gooseberries over to devil's bridge 
and on one side and then from Falmouth to West Chop mm -hmm. and had and receivers in receivers in amongst all the Elizabeth Islands had the canal gated off. And we had Greg Scomel's all his stuff up and down the Cape. So we kind of had like Southern Massachusetts, Martha's Vineyard, uh, Buzzards Bay gated off. We had, he had a, um, existing array off of Peaked Hill that goes out a couple miles. And then we gated off all of Boston Harbor. Um, and from what, from Point Allerton all the way over to Nahant. Yeah. Yep. And so we gated all of that off with receivers and then we tagged fish in Boston Harbor off of the backside of the Cape and in Buzzards Bay and Vineyard Sound. We tagged like 75 fish in the first year or the first, we ended up tagging about 260 fish. Um, and trying to break it out by size in all three areas and ask questions about like, okay, you know, a fish go, all right, if we catch a fish in Buzzards Bay, we also decided to make it interesting and not start fishing till like July 10th and stop fishing them like the first week of September. Hmm. Cause the idea is we wanted to catch them where they were set up for the summer. Which yeah. Is not the easiest time to be fishing for straight bass. <laughs> not at all. Right. <laughs> no. Yeah. We know that. <laughs> yeah. 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 Lots of blue fish by catch. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. We, uh, we, we were definitely, there's a lot of times where we were just struggling and just like, why did we choose to do this? <laughs> yeah, I think it's good to choose that though. Cause I feel like the beginning of the year, it's just, they're moving still. They're just wherever the food is. And it's just like, it's a question mark every time. Yeah. I feel like middle of the year would be a little more consistent. Maybe. I don't know. It, no, that's no, exactly why we did it. That's, yeah. yeah. That's exactly why we did it. We were trying to figure out like, do fish actually stay in one place? Um, and we saw the, so we had the canal receivers there still, we had all these different things and it was really, it was really cool. Like, um, it was awesome to get, it's kind of embarrassing. You know, like we were talking about earlier, we fish out of Plum Island Sound. I have spent less time fishing like Plum Island Sound and Ipswich Bay, like my home at Bass Waters than like a lot of other places in Massachusetts. I, yeah. I could go down and fish Buzzards Bay probably better than I can fish the water out my back door. Yeah. Um, you know, it's just like, a, just it's Salem Sound now. Yeah. I don't know how many hours we've spent fishing Plenty. in Salem Sound. Like, yeah. So it's just like, I, I, like, I know rock piles in Salem Sound where it's like, I'm going to go here like 45 minutes on the ebb and like the wind's out of there. So there, there will be like five fish that are like commercial size fish that are stacked up right here. And every yeah. time you go and you're there, they're there. But like, I can't do that in my own backyard. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's funny that way. But, um, yeah. I think it's better to be diversified like that, though. Yeah. It's, we can't always do it in our backyard either. <laughs> I mean, you <laughs> never know what's going to happen. Yeah, it's yeah. Always that, but totally. it's, like, it, it's cool that way. But um, so, yeah, so we did that and it, it was cool. And we, we figured out a bunch of different things and I'm in the middle of writing all that up. Um, but so, you know, Bill was talking about with those fish that he tagged on the bank. You know, they were coming up through the canal. They go back to the canal. They were coming up through the canal in the spring, like 80 percent of them. But most of them were going down the backside in the fall and following all that bait down the backside. Um, the fish we tagged on the Cape, we saw that again. It was like that same pattern. They come up through the canal in the spring and then go down the backside. But all the fish we tagged in Boston would come up, like all come up through the canal in the spring. And 99% of them would then go back through the canal in the fall. Hmm. You know, they just, they were not going around. There was like one, one, one or two fish a year would go around. Hobbies. All the rest of them would just go right through the canal. Like they were, and most fish that we tagged that we have like three, four, five years of data on, because we did run this array for five years. That was the idea. Like 90% of those fish stayed in the same big area. Like if it was a fish that went north of the canal in the summer, that's what it did. If it was, it was a Cape Cod fish, it stayed in Cape Cod, um, which was really interesting to see. Uh, the, the, the Buzzards Bay Vineyard stuff is, I think, um, in talking to people who, you know, have been fishing there a long time, because that, that's not me, uh, you know, that's a fishery that's really disappeared and like died off. Mm. And we can see that. I mean, we, to get fish, especially big fish consistently, we had to, you know, after spending a couple months trying to do it, we really just ended up focusing on overnight trips to the Elizabeth Islands. That's the only way we could catch big fish consistently there. Mm. Which was the most fun we oh, did God, it was so awesome <laughs> it was some like, it was, slobs there huh yeah oh yeah and it was good and it was like it was again it was fun to like inch, like really dig in and like figure out that fishery and yeah. like figure out like this rock for whatever reason this rock pile will have fish and the, even though those boulders look just as tasty never have fish never have fish them. you know like kind of figure out and then and you'd be fishing a commercial night and be like Oh yeah, this guy knows what he's doing too because it was like the same three rock piles you're hitting yeah. with a commercial guy who's been doing it. But um, but that was I mean they made for you know Bill and I would leave Gloucester at like twelve or one p.m. like noonish, and like drive down, 
either trailer our own boat down from Gloucester from our lab or pick up a boat in New Bedford, launch at like 3 34, you know, fish until like 2 to 4 a.m. Whenever, however long we could fish and depending how good the fishing was. And then, you know, just trying to beat the morning traffic back through Boston to get up to. It Gloucester. was a long commute. It was a long commute. <laughs> <laughs> well, those, those were long days, <laughs> but it was fun. That was cool. Yeah. So it was um, interesting, but they, the, um, the fish there, like we, I'd almost never get them on our receiver. We wouldn't get them like actually inside that array. If you think about like the end of Martha's Vineyard and, and Buzzards Bay sound all, all the way over to Falmouth, um, they wouldn't spend time in there really often. There were some fish would be up in towards the canal in Buzzards Bay, but a lot of those fish, I just, every couple of weeks, get them on the, that Western edge. So I think a lot of those fish that people catch in the Elizabeth Islands, are, and it'd be fascinating to do it again now, because Rhode Island, when we're doing this, Rhode Island didn't really have any receivers in the water now they do i think those are the same body of fish that probably go out to block island yeah they're going along the rhode island coastline and just doing a big loop big there loop. big old Makes loop sense. going around that way because it just like every like four weeks they'd be around for three or four days mm -hmm. you know and then they'd be gone and then three weeks later they'd be around for three or four days so it was it was interesting the, these fish you guys get on a pattern are they generally like a certain size class or are they all different size fish all they they're all on patterns and they're all different sizes but like they're straight bass or i'm just, like it's scary how patterny they are like i like it's i i often say that they're kind of like when we were kids you had like the little like hardwired electric toy car track yeah and it's like you can go to the same spot in like the same week year after year and that bass a lot of those bass will be the same exact bass and we've seen that not in that study but in every study we've done every like, single really. study yeah so it's like it's kind of scary actually it is it's very oh scary. absolutely uh, i mean i know yeah there's so many examples i can think of but like in some one of our more recent studies and we'll talk about this in a second the circle hook studies we had this this one rock that was always great for schoolies and we, we could always get a dozen fish out of there or more and tag them every time and so we tag the bunch there and then sure enough we go back there to the day sometimes um, and we would catch one of our fish that we tagged the year before in the exact same spot. Hmm. I could pull it up and be like, yep, Ben, you caught this one alive mackerel on uh, July 6th. Yeah. And it would be like, we'd be there like on the 8th the next year. That's yeah. wild. Yeah. It was, we just had that happen to us. Yeah. Before. More than once. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I can think of other spots like before I started doing this, um, there was a couple of really good fishing spots and I mean, like, I mean, unbelievable bass and it was, um, just stacked up in this one little area and like guys back in the day you were allowed 60 fish commercially guys were getting their 60 fish and so it, it the next year got a little bit less and that by the end of the third year it kind of dried up and that spot's never fished since so it was like a body of fish that was coming back there mm. and for whatever reason they set up in this area every summer until they kind of got cleaned up yeah that's kind of what motivated this research we've been talking about is with the just over time how the cape cod commercial fishery got so intense off of nosset and chatham just being like it's what are the actual implications of that that you're there's so many people fishing so heavily on this distinct body of fish like mm -hmm. are they truly a distinct body of fish is there a lot of fish coming in and out of it is it the same body of fish every year um you know and again it's like part of the coolness of doing everything as waterfowlers you're always thinking about that because everybody when they get into it they find it like get like a good goose field and like they bang the crap out of it and all of a sudden it sucks yeah. and it doesn't come back because like birds are like that. They come back to the same ponds, the same fields. And if you wipe them out, then you just have to wait till yeah. some other group family group figures it out and goes there. But I think, you know, fish are doing a lot of the same things there. It's crazy how quickly they respond to pressure. Yeah. Like everything in general. Oh yeah. I like, I definitely, in, when you guys talk about the pressure and, charter days versus keep days and everything. We mm -hmm. have friends who recreational fish and we'll be on the same spot on Jeffrey's on a Monday yep. and, you know, get a ton of marks, like not a single takedown. And like then on Tuesday, like my friend will go out there and be like, yeah, I went three for five. It was awesome. Yeah. Oh yeah. Like exactly. Like I'll tell them, I was like, there were marks. It was good. Like, this is what the bait, this is when it's coming through. This is when I saw fish and they'll go out there. They'll do everything I just told them to do and they'll hook up three times. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. Like that's the, the best fishing for us is the week prior to an opening. Yeah. yeah. So whenever it closes, it's long for those that are listening, if you want to catch and release a giant, it's always <laughs> the week prior to an opening of a month. <laughs> yeah, like the last four that. days of August is always good for mm -hmm. some reason. It doesn't matter the moon, yep. usually. Yeah. 
You think it's just less pressure? It's just time since. Cap- yeah. Yeah. I mean, look mm-hmm. at December. It's just, they have all in November just to do whatever they want. And then December is just. I feel like there's a bazillion killed in three days. And then the fourth day, there's nothing. That August example, too. I feel like we. That's like typically when we see that next batch of really big ones come in. Yeah. Especially the last five or six years. Yep. Cautionary tale for you. Yeah. Total digression. Cautionary yeah, yeah. tale for you. I had a spot very similar to one of your spots, a deer hunting spot, mm-hmm. where it was a little pocket. And there's always three or four good bucks in our neighborhood. And I have like five spots within like two square miles, three square miles. Mm-hmm. And so I can just track them as they go. But like they don't have any act. They're, they all bed in protected places pretty much the mm-hmm. bucks so you can't get at them because there's a big um a big piece that you can't hunt that's trustees land um and they bed in there and they bed in some places deep in the marsh that you just can't really get at them in the saltwater marsh um and so i have this really small spot uh and but i like learn just leave it alone like, i don't even hardly i like wait till the rut hunt it for a little sum in the rut because the does go in there and then once the gun pressure starts if I don't, if I'm not in there, if I haven't been in there and not bothering them, all the does start to hurt up in there. Yeah. And so then you get like the second wave of the, of the does that didn't get bred yeah. and all the big bucks will swing through there. And so I had a year where I had three just beautiful bucks I was watching. I, I saw one once and I never got a shot at him like 35 yards through heavy brush tending a doe and like just never he just went the other way yeah. i i i you know got on the call and tried to get him to turn around he's like no 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 thank you <laughs> yeah. i'm on this thing and then like i didn't even realize what deer it was i was like that's a really good deer it's just one of those things you're like okay shooter like yeah i, I got this deer and, and, I'm, and so i was like watching it watching it, like never gave me a shot the doe peeled off i'd heard him come in breaking everything snorting didn't even push the doe to me he pushed away i'm like shit <laughs> and my camera on the other part of the property goes off and i was like oh no it was him you yeah, know like, yeah. you get the picture oh <laughs> crap it was him so i had like actually had a good encounter with him i was around him and everything died down gun hunting started i was just letting like fill up with does um and my buddy was fishing out of chatham in december and this was like 2017 and went down there um you know, fished, we got a fish, which was awesome. There was only like one of two fish landed that day. It wasn't like December, it was the last couple of years. It was, it was a really cool time. It was great. It was just one of those, it was a great trip. Broke ice on the way out, got up to like 45 though. And uh, we just like, just saw a fishy spot. And he's like, yeah, let's, 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 let's see, let's put it out. Let's see what happens. Yeah. Trolling mackerel and didn't even get the second rod out. Got one. Which, That's awesome. Which was really cool. But I got back to land and uh i didn't have a cell camera on this one spot and two days later i went and checked my camera and i pulled it every there was a hot doe in there on that day it was a saturday and (laughs) i would have hunted if i hadn't gone tuna fishing all three bucks were in there for i I can i have the pictures on google photos especially the one big one was he had a hot doe under the stand just doing circles for half an hour from like (laughs) three to three thirty it was just like it was just him going back and forth chasing does i was like Oh, oh no why did i tuna fish that day oh it's crazy yeah it's crazy how they know though oh they know they know, <laughs> they know. don't don't get sucked into the december fishing yeah yeah i know I <laughs> there's know. good there's good deer hunting to be thankfully had. it's been over relatively quickly and i was my season was, my hunting season was done in november for the most part yeah, so a time nice lucky well. yeah 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 all right but, sorry uh, what do you think, no, no, what do you think allows these bass to get back to these same areas like, is this just something that we'll never figure out? I want to figure it out so yeah. bad. I think that, I think when we were talking in the charter, it's like, you guys always ask the superpower question. I, right. Mine would absolutely be, I want to talk to fish. Yeah. yeah. Like, I would want to be able to talk to fish. <laughs> yeah. Be like, okay, why? Why yeah. did you do that? That's what I want to know. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, there's, they certainly have like light sensing capabilities, probably electromagnetic stuff. But I, I mean, there's so many. We're getting to the point now with some of the technology that I think we can start to figure it out. There's, we might be able to figure it out, um, which is kind of like, I think it's good and bad. It's like, I kind of like that we don't know in some right. ways. I like mm-hmm. trying to figure it out. Mm-hmm. And I like that there's some amount of mystery. Uh, that's like a whole nother digression we could take and talk, you guys have started to talk about it. And that's something I think about now um, in my job, cause I'm doing before, sorry, we didn't finish off the track. I, for the first 10 years at the division, I was doing diadromous fish, river herring, shad, eel, smelt, and now I'm doing recreational fishing. I'm leading up a recreational fishing program. But like with the cameras, trail cameras now, I think there's a lot of really legitimate discussions about fair chase. And I don't know how far we really are off 
with fish like it might be something that i, I just would, mentioned this i'm like occasionally <laughs> we're gonna have trail cameras for fish and you exactly you've been talking about it and it's like it's something i've been thinking about as we've like the pan optics and all the big fancy like the yeah sonar, sonar on the big fish. it's like at some point do we need to actually start talking about fair chase for fishing too yeah um like some of the like drones dropping lures and all this other like and like being able to scout schools of fish and then all this other stuff it's like it's getting to the point like at what point does it stop i think the biggest fair? difference is is the area i mean you got 80 percent of the world versus 20 percent of the world where the fish live yeah. i mean yeah you know it's like there's so much water the trail camera thing it's like in condensed areas and like i don't know yeah it's I, tough yeah. it's a tough call 50 years down the line i could see it being an issue but yeah. i mean i already feel like there's no secrets out there like I used to be able to think like I had little secret spots and if I rigged a certain way or whatever, but now with cell phones and the sounders as good as they are and stuff, it's like the communication is so good on the water and stuff like whether it's a social feed thing or social media feed thing or something, it's just like, it's, there's no more secrets. No, the access to information is exponentially increasing, yeah. mm -hmm. but the one limiting factor is time spent. You know, it doesn't matter what, you know what you learn, what you read, what you watch. Right. Time spent. There's nothing that's going to replace what you actually see in those interactions because there's so many different nuances that you can't repeat. And it's how you react and when you see that. Yeah, and it's how you process it and what you do with that information. So. And hooking them is one thing. Then you got to get them to the boat. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, Understanding behavior. Like you can talk about behavior, you know, fish or deer or whatever but until you're in that situation it's all it's all different you know yeah one one thing um i didn't want to step on ben but about how the bass get to where they are so i've also done a lot of cod research um and we had a, a really unique it wasn't even unique but it was like one of the last remaining known spawning grounds off of gloucester in in mass bay and we did the telemetry work and, um, man, we, it started, it was like 2008, nine and 10 and all the way to 12 really. But we had this spawning aggregation and we caught females and males and tagged them. And these females were these, the big spawners. They were, a, an average fish was 30 pounds and we had fish up over almost 70 pounds in this one aggregation. And it was a tight spot. But we have underwater footage of it, like they're all stacked up like cordwood. Anyway, so we tagged all these fish. Um, and sure enough, every year they'd come back to the same spot. And that's not a spot. It's a spot. There was a rock the size of this room that if I got on that rock, that's where they were. You and catch then, all of them if you wanted to. Yeah. yeah. You could hammer them. And yeah. so actually that's what happened. Um, word got out and it started getting exploited. And unfortunately, we had to protect that at spawning aggregation. And so we did. Um but what I was going to say is um, homing. Um, there's a, a research um, biologist up in, I think it was Nova Scotia. And um, he, th he, his hypothesis is that it's actually a learned behavior that like the, the big fish will go into these spots and for whatever reason, say because of the currents or the structure, they go there and it works for them, but then they bring other fish with them, you know, the, you know, one or two year younger fish. And so they learn that migration route. And so then they start coming there. So you catch those bigger ones, but there's always the smaller ones in behind them. But once you cut that off and you catch all those fish, it never comes back and it never gets repopulated. So yeah. it's a, it's a hypothesis, but yeah, so I, I digress. I'm terrible at digressions. So if you guys have this podcast is all about tangents are incredible. Great. I'm in my crap. This is perfect. But yeah. So, so this is, uh, yeah, so this is what I was going to go back. Um, so yeah, that's the entrainment hypothesis and it's an awesome. And so you asked a great question, like, how do they do this? And I, I think that between like acoustic telemetry, some of the genetic stuff that's happening now is so fascinating where you can get clips on fish and like figure if you have enough clips in a population figured out like how closely they are related to other fish mm -hmm. and you can um like figure out more you can do mark recapture now and like all this nutty stuff you can we're starting to figure out as genetics are getting cheaper really cheaper and more powerful at the same time through technology technological advances um we're gonna be able to start to figure that out and like using an example I already talked about. So like, you know, this is, cause I, this is a question that this is actually like the kind of 
ecological question that like keeps me up at night and uh, why I'm part of a big part of what I do. I love doing the management stuff too, but like migration ecology is like that general world is what fascinates me. Um, and so talking about like that, the uh, Verrazano, where the Verrazano bridge is at the mouth of Hudson. So you have fish from using striped bass, you have fish probably from the Kennebec, the Hudson, Delaware, Chesapeake, and North Carolina that are all stopping in the fall to eat food there. Right? So if you're a fish, that was born in the Hudson, there's 22 inches long or 18 inches long, it's going down the river for the first time. It's like joining that coastal stock is what happens. You know, like some fish can talk, like Bill's research also, like they had a passive acoustic, um, like actually listening just to the sounds in the water. And they've been able to record and figure out all these vocalizations that cod are doing to talk to each other during the spawning. Hold up. Like all these sounds. Yeah. What? So some fish talk to each other. Did you know this? I didn't Like know this. Larry the wall bass? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> Dude, I'm good time for butt heavy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that sounds like a whole other podcast. Yeah, yeah. So they, some fish That's incredible. Ab- absolutely vocalize with each other. Um, so, which is cool. Um, I We don't think straight bass do that, but there's gotta be ways they're communicating. And so you have this whole thing is like, I would love to know like the actual mechanism of how they're communicating, but I do that, which I don't think we'll be able to figure out, but we will be able to figure out some of these, I think some of these hot spots and these places and like what hap- what's happening on a larger scale. So I think that, you know, I wouldn't be surprised in the next 20 years if somebody tries to be like, all right, we're just going to catch a crap ton of fish in this place. We'll get fin clips on everything. We'll tag some of them. And we'll figure out how they're all related. And you're going to see that, like, you know, a fish is probably coming out of the Hudson, ending up with school of fish. It's partially Hudson fish, partially Chesapeake fish. And then they probably reintegrate every year, break apart, yeah. reintegrate. Like, where does that, like, Harry Potter sorting hat happen? Yeah. You know, but they probably fall in, like, with a group of people and are like, it's like right. when you go to college. And you yeah, it's like, that makes her- sense. Herd, what is it, herd mentality? Yeah, sort of? yeah, 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 yeah. And so they probably are doing that. But, like, that whole entrainment theory is really cool and we don't know a lot about it but it seems to happen across a ton of different species of fish like Atl- from atlantic herring up to bluefin tuna it's crazy you know so so it's very cool but i think we will get there and um you know kind of closing the loop on this second straight bass project we were talking about a big part of that has been um genetics and so I just finally got um, 5,000 samples sequenced and got all the genetics back in the fall. And this is probably the first actually public time to lay people I'm talking about the data. So this is cool. Um, so yeah, we did uh, basically a thousand fish a year out of Massachusetts waters, commercial and recreational catch across all different size classes. Fin clip, DNA Fin clip, and we can get it from scales too. Yeah. So like we have our uh, sport fish angler data collection team, which is uh, goes by the wonderful moniker of Sad Cat. Sad cat, <laughs> sad cat. We have a, 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 a iconic, like little sad, frumpy sad cat <laughs> on the database. Um, and that's really cool. Um, you know, it's, it's people who volunteer to collect data for us, um, you know, scale samples, length data, everything like that, and then send it in. So I, we have just thousands and thousands and thousands of scale, sam- scale samples from straight bass that I could go back into from area and time period and pull out for this. And then Bill's crew does a great job uh, sampling the commercial catch out of fish houses. So we have all those fish. Um, so I was able to like put up, put together a really great data set across multiple years and multiple size classes. And it's, um, and going back to like kind of that, that idea of like three different regions, because one of the questions we had are, are the genetic, you know, are they different mixtures of different populations or are they the same? Mm. Um, and the chest and like, this is the power of what we developed is awesome. This new panel we have, um, is that we can actually like see strays. Like we collected a bunch of fish in the spawning areas, but it's the data, the genetic data is so good that you can actually basically say like, I'm 99% certain that this fish that we caught spawning in the Hudson is a stray from the Chesapeake. Yeah. Like that's how strong the genetic signal is. We've been uh, taking part in a similar study with uh, Chris Wiener out of Maine um, for the Bluefin Collaborative doing finlet and fin samples. Yeah. Trying to basically build our own database to show kind of some of the same theories slash um, I'm not a scientist, so so yeah, please. Uh, I was talking to Nat like, Moody. Like white paper this. information in regards to like the slope sea spawning area and basically trying to figure out that same sort of thing, like which which fish are strays in the med, which fish are strays in the gulf. You know, is there like a different... Um, is it a mixing? Is like, it a mixing yeah, in, yeah. in this area? Or, so we've been, what, two years into that now? Yeah. I think they... Doing DNA sampling for yeah, I, I talked to somebody who's involved in it. I think he said you guys got like 
the collaborative got like 5,000 samples this year, yeah. which is outstanding. Yeah, it's It'll really cool. Really fascinating to see what comes out of that with all these new tools. Um, but like big picture, um, you know, all of Massachusetts is high 60s to in, you know, Buzzards Bay was like 80% Chesapeake, Delaware. Mm. Um, mm. So heavily Chesapeake, Delaware. It does change by size or age class. Um, and I think that probably has a lot to do with like, pure, like historical recruitment out of the Chesapeake, like how strong it was. Um, but it's pretty interesting. And I'm really, that's data I'm just diving into now, but it's really cool to have that as a resource. And I think it's going to be really informative about, you know, this, the regulations perhaps going forward and just helping us manage fish just better. Scary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you wonder if it's gonna turn into like all right we kind of know where most of the fish from here spawn you know almost like matching regulations or like regulations based on another state right you could do yeah i mean so right now the big problem with striped bass the, one of the big problems with striped bass assessment i don't want to make it sound like the striped bass assessment is bad because they you know we have assessments for many many species and as i think as far as it goes straight bass is pretty good and at the end of the day what do you want an assessment to do you want it to give managers the ability to hopefully somewhat accurately predict what future abundance is going to be so you mm -hmm. don't over harvest but you still get everybody the amount of harvest that they should be able to have like the most without overdoing it mm -hmm. um and striped bass has been pretty good about that like i think it does a good job there are issues one of the big issues i think for a lot of us is that we can't figure out like what coastal catches if you catch if all the fish that are that either are harvested or we think die after post-release on in coastal waters we can't say where they came from so the idea about this is to be able to say that now yeah and because there might be opportunities for people to like catch more fish in certain areas if we can say like look this place is like 100 percent chesapeake or 95 percent chesapeake um there may be other places where it's like we probably don't want to catch as much fish here and trying to understand that if we can understand that better i think at the end of the day is you know a fisheries a scientist for me i'm trying to do the best job i can to make sure that our kids and grandkids are going to have fish to catch and then right now we can enjoy fishing as much as we can possibly can while being responsible stewards for the future yeah you know i want to maximize opportunity while also be responsible moving forward so if there's different ways we can do that that's cool i mean i think where it gets so you know like the big focus of the second project is in a nutshell trying to understand you know where striped bass are born where they spend their summer. So they're going back and forth between their spawning area and their summer place. How do they get there? And then how does that ch affect their chance of dying? Right? Mm -hmm. Because if we have what the fancy scientific way of saying it would be differential mortality, you know, but if there's a difference for a fish that spends its summer on Cape Ann going through the canal both ways versus a fish that just like hangs out in like the kind of the bubble of swimming between Block Island and the Elizabeth Islands, and how often they get encountered by anglers and how often they get harvested, we might need, if it's a big difference, we might need to think about that and work with it, yeah. you know? But if we don't understand that, then we can make really bad choices around our management. And that's like, the, that's the cod story, right? We didn't, Bill's, we've just now had the tools to figure out how site-specific cod were and that you could basically just wipe out these spawning aggregations and then be gone forever. And that's what happened in Maine. That's what's happened in Massachusetts is we've lost all the inshore spawners because we didn't understand that and we didn't protect it. Yeah. And now we're in this position where mm -hmm. that's pretty much gone forever. Hmm. So um, there is that tying it all up. There's that learned component that we're never really going to understand probably how is, it gets learned and how they're, they're communicating that. But they absolutely learn these migration patterns. They learn where to go for food. And they do it year after year. I think there can be changes. You know, if there's a big change like we've seen with Menhaden, I think that's absolutely changed where bass are going in Massachusetts. Or water quality. Water quality can probably do it too. I mean, I think like that's more like the Buzzards Bay thing. It's yeah. just too hot and dirty now in the summer and they don't go in there. That can happen. Those things can can like switch these big migrations and like where fish go. But I think for the most part, you know, they learn where they want to be, where they can successfully go and eat and be relatively safe and get from point A to point B and then they do it. Do you have any data on where these like PEI Nova Scotia striped bass are 
coming and going to and from and all that yeah we were we're not as involved with that on the genetic side um my genetics work is teamed up with some researchers out of the university of new brunswick st john so i've been a little bit more involved with that and i'm a little bit more aware of what's going on but there's everything we can see so far is that there's not like a big interchange um among us and canadian populations of straight bass uh in the st john river in new brunswick there's a more um and that's a it's a weird system i don't know how much time you want to spend on it but it basically they put a dam right in the spawning area. And they actually think that they thought they'd wiped out that population, but every once in a while there'd be striped bass there. And it kind of looks like there are some fish probably from Maine making it up there and spawning there, but there's still fish that are from that river, like that historical stock that pull off a successful spawning every eight to 10 years. Gotcha. Um, then there's this uh, population in the Shubenacadie up in Minas Basin in the Bay of Fundy, um, and, and they're there. And then you have like kind of these restored populations up by where you guys go tuna fishing and PEI, St. Lawrence river that are taking off right now. Yeah. Like those things are taking off. It really seems like, um, genetically when you look, if you just think about like, a you know, like a piece of paper and you drew it into four quadrants, I hit the mic. I told no, you, you got it. You got it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, the, um, and you split up into four quadrants and just said like, if you just took all the differences genetically in these striped bass and like put them on this piece of paper and made piles of by like similarity, like all the, even though like we have this really cool tool that's like helping us do things with us populations. If you put them with the Canadian populations, they would all look like a pile of marbles in one corner for the U S populations. And then you'd have like three or four separate piles. Like these are the orange ones. These are the blue ones. These are the purple ones for the Canadian. There's like very, very little genetic mixing there. Interesting. And it, and you know, so then on the tagging front, cause you can use these things complimentary, you know, we have tagged just at DMF. I mean, we've tagged over a thousand fish now. Um, and then there's other people who are tagging fish all up and down the U S coast. And they've tagged a lot of fish in Canada now. And so far, I don't know of any U.S. tagged fish that have been detected on Canadian arrays. And we detected one Canadian fish on a U.S. on our array. Yeah, yeah. And it was funny. It was one of the Bruce brothers' um, mates called me up one day. He's like, I got one of your tags. I'm like, holy crap, you did? <laughs> he goes, yeah. And he, he described it. I think he sent me a picture. I'm like, yep, that looks like ours. And I said, what's the number on it? And he t- read it to me. He's like, darn it. Nope. No, not <laughs> no, ours. <wasn't. laughs> I got it. Tyler. Man. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, so those um, guys are getting more and more into it. Every year I go up there, like the gears getting better and their tactics are getting better. And there's a lot of them up there, all the way into when we tuna fish up there. Yeah, he described it. It was unbelievable fishing up there. Yeah. Way better than down here, even. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's wild. But that's the same thing you're seeing in the news now with like the fish going. It's the St. Lawrence and all those uh, water bodies down to the bottom of the in the estuary, and they're going up into you know Labrador. Mm-hmm. now in the summer it's crazy it's nuts like you know it's shoulder to shoulder you can just catch schoolies all day in labrador in the summer which is wild mm-hmm. but i mean yeah i think in like a big picture stuff i th- you know um it's i th- i wouldn't be surprised if it, like in 100 years our whatever great 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 grandkids like are basically have like what virginia has now like yeah. they're gonna be fishing on like the southern this the winter the winter, the fall, winter, around. like like yeah. aggregation of straight bass, and you know, I, 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 you know, I think it's great. It sucks for salmon, um, but I think it's good that the St. Lawrence is coming back online. You know, they the Canadians, I think around twenty two thousand eight or so, restocked that with straight bass, and um, that's a really, it's great because now we're starting to see that, and I think it. As Ch- I think the Chesapeake it has lost productivity and will continue to lose productivity with more and more people being in that watershed. It's like, you know, because it goes all the way up into New York and it's 18 million people in that watershed. And it's just not what it was. I don't think it yeah. will be. And it'd be great. You know, when the Hudson has a great year, it's good. And that's um, it's, it's good that that happens. And the Kennebec's putting out some fish now. But they just don't have the nursery habitat. And then, like, just the habitat to put out what the Chesapeake does. I think yeah. the St. Lawrence is the only thing that is ever going to rival that. So, Makes sense. yeah, I don't know. We'll see what happens. But I, you know, it's one of those things where it'd be, if you're really, really serious about having a lot of straight bass, it'd be cool. It'd be one more reason to open up rivers like the Connecticut and the Merrimack, do more of what's been done in Maine with like the Kennebec and the Penobscot, where we're pulling out these lower dams on the river and get that straight bass. I mean, we, we had probably had straight bass in all those rivers, lots of straight bass. Mm. Oh, historically yeah. they had them in the Parker river. We, we live on the Parker yeah. river, which is it's like tiny. this. Yeah. We don't know if they were spawning there, but yeah. like they, they were there, but I mean yeah. like they were, they were catching 18,000 pounds through the ice in the winter of fish, like 
eight to 12 inches long. No it's way. Crazy. Yeah. 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 yeah, using that dip using netting dip them out. Netting at, like they knew the holes they'd sit in and they yeah. cut a square in the ice and then dip net them out on the tide. Wow. Yeah. When you guys are doing these studies, like what for something like uh, the the uh, acoustic ones, what drives that study? Like what's behind the scenes that pushes you guys to do that study? And then once you get the information, what do you do with the information? Yeah, so... I mean, it depends, I guess. <laughs> Sometimes it's, it's a water cooler discussion between me, and Ben, and Micah, but typically it comes down. Um, we try to address either a very specific um, biological question, but more than often, it's addressing a management question. So if there's like, you know, if we need more information on, I don't know, whatever, you know, well, so for example, post release mortality in striped bass, right. um, you know, removals out of the striped bass fishery is huge right now. And especially in light of like all these new circle hooks and stuff that are being mandated. And we didn't know really what, you know, the mortality rate was or the conservation benefit it was between the J and the circle hook. And so that was like, uh, that was a ripe question for us to address with our acoustic telemetry. So that's a perfect example. Can I jump in really quickly? And like straight bass, I think we're, I think that as like managers and again, get like the tail end of your question, just to like set the stage for talking about this, um, we haven't been clear enough with the public where it's like, like biologists and managers. The problem there's two real problems with striped bass right now. All right, there's poor recruitment. So the Chesapeake Bay has been since 2005 has been on a downward slide. We they you know, like right now people are like, oh spawning stock biomass is creeping up. It's like there have been a few good years mixed in since 2005. On the whole, it's been really bad, and especially since 2018, it's been five consecutive like, you know, bottom eight years of a series that goes back to 1950s, mm. you know, like worst years ever. Yeah. So we know that's coming. Um, and so like, that's one big problem is recruitment failure in the stock. Like we know we're going to be up for hard times. The second thing is effort. You know, you guys, you're in your thirties, Bill's in his fifties. I'm in my forties. Like we've seen different slices of the straight bass fishery, but I mean, Bill and I, when we were young, you didn't catch straight bass caught bluefish you didn't mm -hmm. get a straight bass it was weird when you caught a straight bass it was like really cool um and i think nobody's fault but a lot of people came in in the two that late 90s in the 2000s when it was phenomenal i mean that's when i got really into catching straight bass yeah and it was awesome like it was you know i was fishing three reefs you know basically three towns over from where myerson caught the new world record it was awesome fishing mm -hmm. it was exceptional exceptional fish straight bass fishing and i had a great time doing it but at the same time i know a lot of people who got into it in the late 2000s and were doing that and they'd be putting on facebook every trip like three or four trips a week to fish I'm like <laughs> like what are you doing man like this will go bad like it will go bad like yeah. it's nothing's perfect and it's gonna last forever here so um i think there's just a lot of people who have come into the fishery and don't know what can happen haven't seen what can happen so those are the two big issues and then you know so one of those is like we, nobody wants to have an effort restriction on straight bass again. We don't want to go down that road of like trying to put in a season. You know, right now in Massachusetts is year round and most states are, you know, they have season, like some, they might have some season, but it's really about whether the fish are there now. Mm -hmm. And nobody wants to have, you know, effort restrictions where you can't fish during the season. So, um, one of the big, another issue with the assessment is that the assumed post-release mortality is 9%. And nine, 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 nine percent. Enough. And they just, and like, it was a paper that was done by DMF by our former director, Paul Diodati before he was director. And he explicitly said in the paper, like, do not use this as the coastwide estimate of post-release mortality. That is not what the study is designed to do, but they don't have any other numbers. So they use it. So, and it may not be that far off. It may not be, <laughs> in the end, it may not be that far off, <laughs> but. Which is but, a good sorry. thing. Yeah, I just yeah, wanted to like exactly. set the stage. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so this is like, so, you know, coming into like uh, 2018, 2019, as spawn, as you know, like with the amount of fish to catch was coming down and effort was still really high. And we're like half of all mortality, we think is post-release mortality, mm -hmm. like people catching and releasing fish. And, but we know this number, we don't know how real this number is. So that's like, you know, okay, so people are like, this is a real problem. And we were, and so we right. said, well, we like yeah. problems and we like straight bass. Right. Not right. as cool as tuna. No, they are. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> right. So, I mean, that kind of back to what you're saying. So that's how that study came up and is a perfect example of it. Um, so w when that came up, the first thing was, um, I think to be 
to be proactive, Massachusetts initially said, we're going to mandate the use of circle hooks for striped bass. And then we were like, but we don't know exactly what that means. So I, it was my job during COVID. Everybody was stuck at home. I actually got to go fishing during COVID. It was really nice. And uh, it I was we went really out. Nice. It was amazing. <laughs> it was amazing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't great for everybody, but right. yeah. the selects few apparently like us, yes. it worked out. Um, so yeah, so we went out and um, we designed a study to test. Um, we actually used a, um, a 7 Gamagatsu J-hook octopus and an 8 octopus circle hook in, um, straight um, in line. And we tagged, that first year we tagged 150 fish and um, we used, it was just a bait study, just looking at these two types. And we fished not unlike, very similar to the way that we fished when we went out with you guys on the Fortuna. Yep. We were using like small mackerel and then we did some chunking and stuff. So basically what we did in designing the studies, we tried to use two of the most typically used hooks um, by recreational fishermen using a very um, common technique. And, um, and so we, what was really cool, so we came up with an estimate and we compared the J to the circle. Um, you know, for those two hooks, and maybe to listeners, this wasn't a big surprise, but there wasn't a significant difference between hooking mortality between that single J on those hook, two hooks on those two hooks alone, right? Yeah, but really, what came out of that study and um, a little bit unattended, but what we were able to do is we were able to quantify mortality by these different parameters. So we could look at like water temperature, air temperature, handling time, um, and where that foot fish was hooked. And then we could look at the trauma. And then when we released it, we looked at vitality, how strong it swam away. And just looking at those key indicators, we could tag the fish, we recorded that information, angler experience and whatever, we'd let the fish go. And then in non real time, we would track it using these, the telemetry system, mm -hmm. this, this grid of this huge array of grid of receivers that we plastered, um, Beverly Salem sound with. And so we could watch them swim. And sometimes like if it was like a fish, say that was hooked in the gill, um, blood pouring out, we'd tag it, which was hard to do because these tags weren't cheap. We'd throw it over and you'd just kind of watch it sink to the bottom. And we would watch it and sure, so that maybe that fish died. But some of those would go down and kind of swim away like, I don't know, Ben, I don't think that's going to make it. And it does. And you know, or sometimes we saw delayed onset of mortality. Sometimes you'd tag them, they'd swim slow, and eventually we'd be able to they'd die like three or four days later. And hmm. so all these tags had an accelerometer in them. Yeah. So it's not only just saying I'm here, but it also told us whether Is they're it swimming? actually swimming. Yeah. 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 Um, so it was like really cool tool and we did it for two years so we ended up having a lot of fish but the definite yeah this so we basically were able to build a model that predicts on these different factors whether or not a fish would die or not after they're released and um so we had this information for you know we ended up doing four different hooks and, yeah, and there we've was, done more since. And we've done more since. We've been, we worked some this summer. We didn't get enough done but with the ones you guys are using, the mustads, which were... The demons. Yeah, the demons, perfect circles. Those, those, little, those little ones, <laughs> those too. I like the five yeah, O's. Five, so the five O's. The five O's. But, okay, so I was fishing. <laughs> all right, let's digress one second. So I'm like, here I am. I'm, so I'm like, okay, we're going to try these. Demons. We went out with you. And they did work really good, especially on your boat. We did great with those. So I was like, okay, I went and bought a couple packs of them, gave them to my techs, and we went out fishing. And... um Man, we got into school of big, big bass, and I had big mackerel. I couldn't get the tanks or anything. On the five zero, I struggled to get missing up. fish. Yeah, yeah, I was getting takedowns, but I couldn't get them. It's like I didn't know if it wasn't getting. And I tried bridling. I don't know. Maybe you guys got the trick. But then I went to the seven, yeah. and they worked much, much better. Yeah, yeah. We do go to the seven sometimes with the bigger baits, but what I do sevens of pogies. If I'm not like trolling them, I'm just like pitching them. What I'll do is I I go through like kind of the center of the top jaw but i almost come out like the nostril yep. a little bit it's between like a the little nostrils, offset a soft spot yeah there's like a little you can even offset it a little bit too and it's way softer yep um then because those big macro i mean it's like going through a piece of plywood sometimes when you go to the center of the top jaw absolutely yeah. and you miss bite after bite after bite but and those bridles you know those elastic bridles can actually be pretty strong yeah you yeah know? I've started using those more, actually. Yeah, yeah. but they, they do take quite a bit of pressure to break. Mm -hmm. You know, like you do have your hook gap exposed, but it's still, if it doesn't break, you have a mackerel that's coming into the corner before the hook gap gets in the corner. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, but we find just the smaller 3X Demon 
just way less goggles, yeah, especially three. with inexperienced anglers on the boat. Yep. Yeah. You know, like they're overfeeding generally a few seconds, but that smaller, that smaller gap kind of gives you a little bit of forgiveness to get it where you want it to be. You gave Taylor like a lot of shit that we caught more fish on your boat than his boat, right? I mean, it's par for the course. Okay. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure. I wanted to close that. Sir. He was on sure. a bass boat. <laughs> <laughs> True. The little boat is more designed for that type of fishing. Yeah. yeah. No, as I recall, that was I'm trying to think of that was like a full moon. Both deal. trips weren't they were, were on good like tides. horrible yeah, tides. tides. Every terrible. It tides. was like we got like a beginning f- of the incoming. I think for our first trip yeah. on Fortuna, like coming up to them, like I don't even want to go. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to go because if if anybody that fishes around here knows that middle of the season, like it's very hard to catch a substantial amount of fish unless you're fishing the outgoing. Yeah. I get it was still going on the Fortuna it was one of the highlights of my summer because I got to see your dad, Full dad. fully instruct Bill Hoffman <laughs> oh, yeah. how to catch uh, mackerel on a sabiki. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So that oh, was that God. was the highlight of my summer is to watch your dad. That's who no, was just, no, no, no. that's who was just calling us. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I was like oh. I said I'm in a po- we're in a podcast. What's up? I was just catching up. <laughs> that so was the highlight of my summer. That's the highlight of every day for us. <laughs> oh god, it's so good. You know what though? The bait bait fishing is the most dangerous part oh God. he says it correctly he says this is the most dangerous part of our job is bait fishing with mm-hmm. people that don't bait fish it's like yeah. you can't trust them no matter how good they, like we have people on the boat all the time that say they're like these pro like fish all over the place and then they wrap a sabiki rig over your ear yeah mm-hmm. I'm like what the? i mean obviously i can catch bait I will say his trick was a good trick. I'll give him a little which credit. One, which one was? I don't even remember. Hold the weight and then... Oh, t- yes. T- so everything's yes, just hanging can, for you. Yeah, it's yeah, also tightness. boat specific, though. It He's is got his boat. system down for the big boat. The little boats... You can't do that. Entirely different. Oh, yeah. Slack. We go bucket. Yeah. So a little boat live oil is like underneath some rod holders and, and stuff, as you guys know. So like you can't just dip a rod over it. Yeah. So we go into a bucket. Once a bucket has a few baits, throw it in. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I, I stole one of your sayings too. I think at some point on the Fortuna, you're, we were we had like a couple like you know we're throwing Max into the rock and you're like, we're all adults here. Let's like get this over and throw this in the mix too. <laughs> I think I've said we're all adults here a bunch of times. Yeah. This fall. Oh yeah, <laughs> we can do I'm this. A, I definitely, when it comes to inshore fishing, I am more rods the better. I don't know what it is. I just like I like borderline disaster tanglement because I feel like you just get way more opportunities. Um, obviously there's times when you like drop down the amount of setups that are in the water, but I like having a lot of hooks in the water. I'll fish three down rods, two, three floater rods, and just make this shit interesting. The co- well, wow. this is the corollary. You said shit. This is the corollary to the poop bite. I mean, right. you're, you're inviting disaster because that is probably going to bring success. Oh yeah. Correct. And if you invite the disaster, then maybe something. But like in happen. the rivers and stuff, you guys are fishing enough rivers, rivers, you know, when they come through, they come through. So like if you are fishing two rods you'll bang some fish out and you probably won't get any tangles. But if I'm next to you and I have five, six rods going and the school comes through, I got five going off and we're going to get some tangles. But And when you have the herd there, win. think about how many follower encounters you have. So oh, if you got oh, two yeah. or three on, each with a follower encounter and then you have other rods yeah. pitching behind you. It's it like, can be a mess. You yeah. got to read your charters too. Totally. But anyways. Do you guys try to capitalize on followers with blue fins? <sighs> I'm trying to think. We've had a few times in yeah. like peak at Hill. We've Small left fish, rods out. Live bait fishing. Small we ones. A lot. We leave rods out. Yeah. yeah. Um, we did it with, by accident with a few giants. Tell them about the your follower when you hooked. The, oh, yeah. We we had a little one. On the down and then you left the floor. Yeah, so we hooked the little one on the down rod at like the very end of the day. And it was, I don't know, I think it was like eight inches long. <laughs> and it, it came up and it was, it was a legal fish. It wasn't really eight inches, but it was probably like in the low 40s. And uh, so we got a gaff on each side. My dad's got a gaff. I got a gaff. And the thing's doing like these black back figure eight mess things under the boat. We haven't even got off the ball yet. And it, I could see the hook was like right in the tip of the nose, which happens a lot on small fish with circle hooks. And uh, so it's doing that. And we're like about to gaff it and then don't and about to gaff it and don't. We never swung at it. It was just a little too far away. Plus the thing was going ape shit. We didn't want to lose a gaff. And it kind of like digs a little bit under the corner and he's like, screw it. I'll just get off the ball. So we still had one of our, one of our floaters out. I reeled the middle rod in and, uh, 
So I just, what we do if, if we're trying to get like multiple bites or if we don't have time to get the other rods out because these shorts come in so fast, you guys know on 130s, like tiny ones, mm -hmm. we just basically free spool the other rod with a clicker on and deal with it. And the rod just goes wherever the rod goes. And uh, so we got off the ball and we are like just about ready to gaff it. And the thing's just kind of digging a little more. And I had the drag loose because I didn't want to pull the hook. And my dad goes over and just puts the drag at 40 pounds, like <laughs> like a giant drag. And he just goes like this. And I go, no, don't, don't. And the hook comes out. And it's like the end of the day. We didn't have a bite all day. So like that was our shot. I know it sounds lame, but, you know, they're going to bring meat home. And oh, yeah, it was awesome. going to be a decent day. So um, we pulled the hook on the fish. And I basically F-bombed at him. I'm like, dude, the, just wait three more seconds. We would have gaffed him. But whatever. And as the words came out of my mouth, the other rod went off that was left out. And it was like a 650-pounder. And we ended up killing it <laughs> at the end of the day. <laughs> yeah. So. Awesome. Yeah. It was great. Sometimes leaving them out and creating havoc works. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It um, amazes me when you're fighting a fish how many you mark. Like yeah. I'm, whenever I come off the edge and I'm, I got a fish on or whatever. I mark better then than I usually do when I'm on the ball. I agree. Yeah. They come in and check it out or something. Usually you're on. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You're either on or. I want to, next time he hooks up, I want to like drop, drop off anchor and just try drifting next to him. We've we, had we peak swap hill. balls a lot. Yeah. We swap balls a ton. Not in any weird way or anything. That sounded <laughs> sound really weird. We can it's swap right. anchor. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> we swap balls. No. Blind try, I'd say because of your speed. You yeah. come over to our ball ball more. Yeah. Um, plus, you usually take a little extra time to set up because you have, and you're in trolling motor a lot too. Yeah. So like we'll hook up early, early, and he just comes right over, and he's you're like high percentage rate of getting a bite on other people's balls. Mm -hmm. it sounds yeah. so weird. It does. Sound Mike even in a couple times. Yeah, Mike, a couple times. Ours. It's just the kind of the way that that boat is with the trolling motor. And depending on the day, like you show up, you're like, all right, there's a tide change at sunrise. Everyone's already going to be set up an hour to two hours before. It's going to take 45 minutes for everyone to swing off the edge. It's like, I'll just use the trolling motor for two hours and not have to deal with it. And I'll be the only one fishing the sweet spot for that 45 minutes. And then either you hook up or someone hooks up or I hook up. You know, you don't end up on anchor right away in the morning. It's kind of nice. Up on, and yeah. Honestly, like... I was talking to Jeff about this, and I know we're tangenting. We'll go back to our circle hook study in a second, but it's a bummer that you can't, like we used to go out and just cruise around before we set up and find the bait and figure out what side of the high spot it's hanging on, depending on the current direction and wind direction and whatever else. Now it's like it's a rush job, and you just put all your job. stuff out and you're you're selling yourself short. But that's what's nice about the trolling motor is you give yourself a little bit of scouting time in the morning and you're still fishing too, you know? Really yeah. Nice. On kill days, most guys are going out the night before to get the spot. I know. Yeah. And it's not even to scout. They're just fighting for the spot. Yeah. yeah. And that makes it a lot more difficult. And that, I feel like that's for us, changed. It's wicked difficult. Oh, I can't imagine. Because you got people coming that they don't want to leave at midnight, you no. know? Plus that, that trolling motor, that spot lock is such like up on Jeffries, we fish some tight bottom. Like there's just these tiny little humps. And if you don't have the peak of the hump, you're not going to get bet. Yeah. And, uh, and then like you get on it and like, yeah, you know, I get there sometimes early, early, I'll get the spot, but then sure enough, someone will come up anchor right next to me and I swing off and now they got the spot. Yeah. yeah. So having that motor would be, an and advantage. it's not even just the spot, right? You're fishing, you know, you're fishing, let's use the August release day for an example, like, it's only two boats in the spot, but the highway that they're approaching the feed spot from is, you know, in a no north northeast direction. So then anyone that sets up north of you or shoal of you, even though you've been on the spot for two days, they see gonna, first. they're going to pressure the fish before they get to you. Yeah. You know, so you're almost better like jumping to the other yeah. end of it or jumping way down or shoal way down to the end of it because... They're generally not going to just roll through in a single file line. Like they're going to come through, you know, in a wave or an angle or in some sort of formation. So if, if like the side of the formation is getting plucked off by the fleet and your shoal south of everybody, that herd that's just going to ride over the high ground is going to hit you. Yeah. You know, we do do that a lot, especially on the big boat, because we, we're a little bit slower and we can't leave crazy early. We'll go shoal and the direction that we think 
that coming from it. It definitely helps. Like yeah. On kill days, we haven't fished up that high or that north or south for a week straight. And then, you know, you get out there and there's 8,000 boats. And it's like, okay, we can't sit where we have been sitting. So we'll go kind of the direction we think they're coming from. And we get bit a lot, like way up on top. Um, whether we think they're coming from there. The, the tricky part is when they're really on herring and they're coming from the deep a lot. And that mm-hmm. becomes hard because you can't fish the deep side a lot. Uh, you can, guys do it and they they get bit. It's just for some reason. For, Their approach for, seems different. Their approach is like not as consistent as if it were coming from the east side over the shoal. It's almost like they get into hunting formation as they come up onto the shoal yeah. and then attack the bait. But if they're coming from the deep, they're hitting a wall. So they still can kind of like camouflage their themselves as they approach the structure that makes any sense yeah Yeah, totally um and then there's days you can't figure it out (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah yeah no rhyme or reason i feel that you guys i think one of the advantages i mean you guys have the network and then you're out you know both boats or one boat almost every day where it's i think for bill and i we're always like three days like that's what it like three days fishing a spot or bite like like at first day you're like all right, what's happening here? Like, yeah. What are we then like the second day? You're like, okay, I think I know what's going on. Yeah. And then the third day, you're like, okay, this is what's going on. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. If we can, if it's rare, we can. This year it was good though. We did better. This year we had a couple spots up by us that were more pretty consistent. Pretty, yeah, consistent. And that it was, I mean, it was the best year I had because leaks, I could go there, do the same thing almost all summer and have a really good shot to get hooked, getting bit. Yeah. Yeah, there's a couple spots that we figured out yeah, what was, was going on this year. It was it went well. There's spots like that. I know like there's a couple <clears> spots <throat> on West Bank with you guys where like I, I totally get what you're saying where I, I feel like especially like morning versus afternoon where they're coming from. Yeah. And you can be like, I'm gonna get on this side of the fleet. Yeah. Be mm-hmm. be away from it. Totally. Have that first shot. Mm-hmm. Get away. And sometimes it does not pay off and you wish you were just the guy where you were or you know where the bite's gonna be. Like yeah. Southwest Corner is one of those spots that I don't know if you guys have fished down there much, but there's like f- three or four boats area that you know out of those four boats, at least one guy is going to get bite every single day. And then there's the randoms. Yep. But it's uh, it's a very tight little spot. If you don't leave the night before, you're not going to be one of those four boats. Mm-hmm. Um, that's like the flag. That's <laughs> the yeah. uh, yeah. place drives me nuts. Oh, you'll mark the crap out of the fish there, and you just but they're already it seeing everybody else. Exactly. Yeah. There's like at least 13 boats on that one tiny piece of bottom. The only guys that get bit are those guys usually early on that one point where you know where it is, and those guys will get fish, and we all just watch them, and yeah. then they just those fish just and you just mark them all day, and you cannot. And then once in a while you get like that rando, but it's yeah. that yeah. plus is frustrating. Fishy, but frustrating. Yeah. So what did you guys find was the best circle hook for bass? I'm interested to hear. I don't think we did. No. Really? I. That's why I have my phone. I have all the hooks that we've tested. Um, so we've, we've, so basically after, you know, similar, like when we talked to you yeah. um, and we talked to people in shops and anglers and stuff, and we're still working on it and we're still hoping to test more hooks, but um, we've tested... Let's see. Uh, so we did the BKK 10, um, the 10 Eagle Claw Circle, the Mustad 5 0, your, your Demon. Um, and then we did the Gamagatsu 7, that's the Octopus. Um, Gamagatsu, uh, let's see. Yeah, the 8 0. Yeah. Yeah. Two Six and eight. fish are just so different it's size. Like, yeah. You know, it's like, well, there's no standardization in circle hooks. And that's that's why we're testing so many different ones. And then it'll be, it's kind of funny. Like some days we'll be like, oh, this one's got potential. And then the next day it, it sucks. So yeah. there's no, so far out of all those hooks that we've tested, we haven't seen any like significant difference between any of them. So I think that um, it's important though, because these circle hook rules, although we haven't found like the silver bullet here and I wish we could, but it is creating awareness with even the casual angler. So when they come up and all of a sudden they're like, well, I can't use my J hook anymore. It says no. And so at least they know then it's like, okay, I got to be extra careful with this fish, whether I'm releasing it or how I'm handling it. If I take a picture of it, like, so I think the message is getting out. And I think by the using circle hooks i think it's creating that awareness too so i see the positive i wish again i wish we could find the the magic hook but we're still working on it did you see a huge difference of mouth hookups between circle hooks and j hooks maybe you don't even want to say (laughs) no 
No. Really? Um, it wasn't a huge difference. So, so yeah, no, let me, so there was a difference if I'm going to like think about like two projects ago and now. So I'm just like thinking like, so there was a difference between, um, there wasn't a difference in mortality. There was a difference in hook locations. And what we found is that, um, and I, I think we talked with you guys on the boat and you've seen the same thing is a lot of times you'll be fighting a fish with a circle hook and you won't realize it was gut hooked. And all of a sudden you'd be like, oh crap, I lost the fish. But then you're like, nope, it's still there. Yeah. And that hook probably pulled out and ended up in the hinge. You yeah. probably had like a shallow gut hook or something somewhere up in the back of the roof of the mouth or something like that. It pulled and ended up in the hinge. And so we did find there were more lip and mouth hookups with circle hooks than J's, but we found that there were more gill damage hookups with circle hooks than J's. And getting hit in the gills is what we really found is like, that is the worst possible thing. Hmm. to happen for a straight totally pass. that's when they slash any you, fish like if they get say. touched in the gills like they're they're immediately the lowest percent chance of dying is like 55 60 percent yeah they're like and then if you stack handling time fight time all that water temperature up it's like gets up into like 80 90 percent you're gonna you're gonna croak yeah. um so that's what we found is that even though so there was more lip hooks for circle hooks than j hooks but the mortality ended up being the same because there was also more gill damage yeah yeah um so that's what we ended up seeing there. Um, yeah. And we tried messing around too with drop back. Like how long, like you're saying you're fishing all those rods. And in my head, I'm like, well, circle hooks would probably be pretty good for that. Cause if they all go at once, you know, the drop back's going to be longer. But even then we tried like short striking it, um, trying to let it swim to try to see if we could detect just a difference, not even like predict like the better way to hook a fish and um even then it was it was like sometimes they're just they're feeding hard and they just inhale or you have current you don't have or you don't have current or you have a sea condition or you don't have like there's so many variables to just like we recommend three second drop back and then apply you know eight to ten pounds of drag right yeah Yeah. and then there's the hook removal variables yeah yeah the types of hook those people are using you know are they and I think that's something we haven't totally, well, we haven't qu- quantified well, And but there, you, that is a good point. So handling time, the longer the fish is out of water, the higher the, pos- the potential of mortality. And if, you've, if you're a good angler, an expert angler, you know how to get circle hooks, deep hooked circle hooks out quickly. Mm-hmm. But the average guy that fishes a few times a year may not. And right. just the more you handle fish, the quicker you get at it. So there is an experience level. And that wasn't well captured in our it, studies. It wasn't. And that was like one of the things. So, you know, all these, um, the post-release mortality tagging studies, every single trip was either Bill or I as captain. And we, we'd fish a little bit for the most part, we'd be running the boat and you'd have different anglers of different skill sets on there. And you, you're trying to capture like the true angler experience. But at some point you're like, all right, you've been screwing with that bass for a minute and a half. Give me that. And like in 10 seconds, you're like, burp, burp, all right, I got yeah. it out. Like, right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you, you're like, you know the tricks and you can get it out. So it's that hard. Is, yeah. Like, you know, a, a fish that I can you know, Bill or I would catch fight for a minute and a half and it, but it would be gut hooked like we would get the hook out very fast where like different angler would not and they'd have like a three minute yeah. you know even someone time. that had it in the lip yeah it someone can, that had it in the jaw might take longer than you take one out gut hooked and the one in the jaw dies and the one the gut hooked lives another reason bait fishing is the most dangerous I'm, i don't even let other yeah, people I'm use unhook sabikis i'm like just give me that yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly but, just give me that i'll do it yeah but um, then we did cut some hooks off and left them yeah, in, we, in the gut did. too because that's another practice that we would recommend that if you can't get it out cleanly and quickly just cut it just cut it yeah mm. absolutely so, one question i have is uh especially with circle hooks you get that you know you get them in and you realize that it's through the stomach you can clearly see the hook and you're pulling on the stomach yeah what are your thoughts on best practice on removing that? Like we have the ones that flip it around, but there's also those times that it's like barely holding on and it just like literally pops out and now you're ripping the stomach. Are those fish dying, you think, that you're ripping the stomach or are they healing up? I mean, it's tough. We didn't like there's no get blood. that detailed in our analysis. Right. But I mean, I know I do know because prior to this study, this was a cool study. I was We did um, a diet study. So um, we were looking at, this is, goes back, 90s i think but we were looking at what striped bass were eating at that time there was like a lot of people saying oh they're eating all the lobsters and whatever so we did a diet study and so um i went out one summer and i killed like we, we had to look at their stomachs so i took like over 500 bass and we opened them all up and um 
what was interesting is then you really get a good look at the anatomy. And if you've cut fish, you've seen it too. There's a lot of veins and organs that are uptight to the stomach. And so if the hook goes through and hits one of those interior, interior arteries or veins, or if it pierces an organ, then obviously it's not going to survive. But lots of times you look at that hook and it, you tear some skin in the stomach. As long as it hasn't done any major damage in beyond that, I think that the probability of that healing and surviving is better. Yeah. I mean, they go out eating a scop, dude. Oh yeah. my god, the spawn. You know what They're I mean? Gonna, oh yeah. yeah. Like I just that's what makes me think circle hooks are probably better than J hooks as yeah. far as stomach hookup. If you guys use scup as bait, yeah, strikers. great. I've, I love, We're using amazing. the canal a couple of times. Not up here, obviously. Yeah, yeah. the access, but. Yeah, growing up in, in striper fishing in Southern New England, I miss fishing for scop. He doesn't believe me. Yeah. <laughs> he doesn't. He's like, Rrr. I'm like, oh, I just want scop. <laughs> we had a couple of maritime. There was a fishing club at Maritime when we were there. Actually, it came to fruition when you were there. I had just yeah. left, and they were taking legal scup to Peak at Hill and slow trolling them in the riggers and catching seventy inch bluefins on them. Great wow. baits. Wow. They're, they're yeah, they're good. But I mean, like a striped bass back to the whole stomach, you know. Yeah, no, it's, like, it's penetrating stomach wall, whatever. I feel like if it's the stomach's flipped inside out, or you can clearly see the tip of the hook, you didn't really damage it. You didn't really damage it. Yeah, yeah no. I, I would say if I'm holding it there and I can see, like, the, even if it's gone through and I can see the tip, I, I'm trying to get it out. Yeah. yeah, I mean, like again, it's like if you don't know what you're doing, please cut it, put it back in the water. Like, yeah, like you guys, you, you're unhooking tons of, and you know the little tricks. If you can get that thing out quickly without like pulling the stomach more and more out of the mouth, mm -hmm. like you know yeah then yeah. get it out um so i would say like our our gut hooks on circle hooks we do have a lot of them and specifically on sub 28 inch fish um i'm trying to think like just last season not that many fish that were gut hooked that i'm that were like gushing blood mostly like gill hook type stuff but almost all the gut hooks the whole hook was through and you could see the hook mm -hmm. on yeah. the circle hooks um versus a j hook where i would imagine that it's going through and grabbing something yeah you know yeah it's coming throughout and puncturing yeah yeah but yeah again it's, it's all depends. it's hard yeah i mean we the, i will say like as a, another little caveat to everything is that we were using a lot of mackerel live mackerel dead mackerel and chunks i mean you guys have caught bass on different baits and like i think that they attack bass or mac bass attack mackerel in a way that's different than other baits. Yeah. Totally. Oh yeah. The way they're chasing him. Tuna everything. attack mackerel different than yeah. other baits. Yeah. 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 And, and so I, I think that is a factor in, um, in how well or not well circle hooks work. Yeah. I just genuinely think when it's a live mackerel, they hit it so aggressively if yeah. they want it. Yeah. You know, there's obviously times where they chase it and follow it and injure it and eat it. But most of the time it's just a very aggressive attack. Boom. You yeah. know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which yeah, would go that. hand in hand with a deep hook set. Yep. Yep. Um, so once you get that all that information, what are you guys doing with that information? Yeah, so we, so yeah, so we, we kind of have like Bill, Micah, and I's grand vision is to like actually come up with a beautiful, comprehensive across all gears estimate of post release mortality that can be used coast wide. So that first step was figuring out, you know, we tagged a bunch of fish and did a specific hook, specific baits, but we came up with this great model that can help us predict mortality. So then when we went out with you this summer, we're kind of putting that model to the test or uh, we really, we have a lot of faith in the model. We're trying to get more data for it. Um, and so we've started a citizen science project where we have people collect the information that we know is important from the, ta the tagging study we did and, but they can use any tackle they want, um, or any bait they want, any mm. hook they want. So we're getting a really good sample size, a really good look across a ton of different, you know, everything from, you know, fly fishing guys to trolling tube and worm and everything in between. Mm. Um, and if anybody, we can give you guys the link to put on the podcast, but it's, uh, it's easiest just uh, mass.gov forward slash striper. Huh. Mm -hmm. Watch out for the autocorrect. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but mass.gov forward slash striper. Um, and, uh, and so you can do the citizen, we're doing a second year now, but in the first year we got almost, and this is like the cool part about it. The project too, is, you know, Bill and I spent and a bunch of other people at work spent two years and we caught 700 fish and we have data on and, uh, over two summers. And we did this one summer of citizen science and we had like 4,000 fish That's that sweet. got submitted. Yeah. It's amazing to That's awesome. have yeah. that. And, you know, we, so we send out a stopwatch, a thermometer and a data sheet explaining everything that you need to do. 
Um, and, and we do raffle prize drawings. So we've gotten a, a ton of information. If you go to our website too, what's really cool. We, um, partnered with backcountry hunters and anglers. So we have a data portal and you can go and look at all the results. So you can see exactly how many fish have been caught, like what the background, we have like a brief survey when you sign up, how, what, what your experience is, how long you've been fishing, how many times a year do you go? Um, you can see like what gears you use and how the overlap, like the Venn diagram of different That's fishing cool. types, obviously fly fishing and bait has the like no crossover, but then you have like guys who do everything and yeah, yeah it's neat. So we have a lot of really cool information there. Um, and we're learning a lot about it, which is interesting. I think the, the one of the big factors that we didn't see in Salem Sound study as much, we just started to see a, a hint of it, but it's pretty cool water there year round because it gets flushed with Gulf of Maine so well, is that there's a real kind of sharp bridge with water temperature where it doesn't matter too much. And then it gets above like 73 to 75 and it is terrible for those, for bass. Hmm. Like they just, they're just really their chance of living afterwards goes downhill. I mean, you guys probably even seen that releasing them. Like I know when we were doing our tagging, we'd be like up in Boston or buzzers Bay. Oh, oh yeah. my God. And you put them in the barrel and like, cause we revive the fish after we tag it and we go to release it. And the thing would just kind of like roll out of your hands and slowly swim away. But then we would go to like to chat and we'd be fishing off the backside with a water freezing cold there like they rip keep, right off oh, oh my yeah. god they bust out of your hands they explode. Yeah. yeah boston harbor yeah I mean, so bill tagged however many fish in that first study didn't have a single post-release mortality right not one in that cape cod study in the bank study and then we tagged you know 150 plus fish in boston harbor and off cape cod not a single post-release mortality and those fish we tagged in buzzards bay i mean we probably had if we caught 15 fish in a night we'd have at least one that would just you know for no handle them exactly the same yeah. as we would any just other day like just like just so stressed out from being in that warm water already that they just roll over you whatever you did you couldn't revive them it could be a lip hook quick fight quick surgery like seamless surgery i mean like boston weird. harbor you could screw up have to make two incisions and like do weird stuff and they'd be fine and then like you just they're just too hot for them. That's crazy. So that's, that was a big one. Um, we are seeing different mortality rates. So what I was saying about mackerel, we're seeing different mortality rates, slightly different mortality rates for different baits, but we're, um, and we're yeah, for yeah. like example, like we're, so we're looking at artificials cause this is the next piece of the puzzle for post release mortality after the circle of stuff. And so if right now you can go and look for yourself off our website, um, there's really, that data portal is really well done. And what's cool about it is as the data comes in, it's almost not real time, but it's very close to real time. So as the data starts marching in again this spring and this summer, we're going to keep tweaking these these um, these uh, figures. Figures, yeah. So like the lure stuff, it's kind of what you expect, but like the best um, hook location is like a single a jig with a single hook, and then if you go up to say like a rig sluggo or something that has like two single hooks there's a lot more chance of um, a bad hook set or bad hook location. And the worst would obviously be the, the two tra double yeah, travel. Two yeah. 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 But so there's a lot of that kind of information in there. That's, that's really interesting that yeah. we're going to be using to also. And then, so I guess the final part of the study is once this is done, we're going to be doing a survey. And so the idea is that, well, one this year we're last year we did it in Massachusetts. Um, and, and it's anybody. open to everybody, but we didn't do a great job of advertising. Right. I think that it's open to anybody because we were, I think a lot of people just saw that it was like, oh, Mass DMF is doing yeah, yeah, it. Therefore, it's yeah. for Massachusetts people. So like Ben and I are going to a saltwater fishing show in March down in New Jersey, and we're going to start promoting the study. And hopefully we'll get more input up and down the entire East Coast. And then after that, then we can, um, we're going to put out a survey and asking for anglers experience and what do they typically use for lures and how much and stuff. And so we can actually then, once we have a, a good sample size of the general population of how they fish, then we can start applying what we've learned through our past studies to a post-release mortality. And that's how we're finally going to bring this all in together and come up with this new estimate of post-release mortality. Yeah. Yeah, we need to figure out like what each gear has for post-release mortality and then how often it's used so we can actually come up with an estimate of like the number of fish that are getting caught that way. And I mean, and some of it's like really basic stuff that, you know, you guys know, it's like more points, probably worse like outcome for the yeah. fish. But we, I think what's cool about it is that like now we're going to have a real number for it. It's not just like, well, I know that's worse. Yeah. Like we need to know the actual number. But yeah, and then even that we're seeing different live baits have differences like mackerel and eel seem to ha lead to more like gut hooking than menhaden and some of the bigger baits makes sense with the size and, mm. and yeah. all that yeah exactly yeah um i have 
uh, question, or, or I got to take a piss first. Me too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. We'll do a little break. But training and education and then maybe tying this all back into like charter fishing and involvement with that and working with charter boats and kind of that side of the house. Yeah. It'd be yeah. sweet. So you want to just take a quick. Yeah. yeah, yeah quick we'll just see everything break. recording. Everything but... will just stay recording. And then when we're all back, we can. Bill's a camel. He doesn't need a break. Uh, actually, I could go. You can do this one. I'll go. George, we're recording again. George, we're back. We're back, break. George. George, stop taking a nap. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Don't include the other Have stuff. you ever had <laughs> some type of like question come up or um, somebody like approach you to f- research something that like you knew was not for a good reason, if that makes any sense? Like that could be detrimental to... to something that you're trying to accomplish and you may not want to answer this like have you had have you had somebody approach you and be like you know can you figure out this this and this and then you think you you look down the road and you're like this is not going to be good yeah so i mean not so much like results based but i've the, the the thing i dislike the most is when someone will come to us and be like we've got this much money and like now do something with it and it's like and it related to like i've been people have asked me to do like gear work working with gill nuts and stuff like that and i'm like this is a bad idea but they we have to go ahead and do it anyway so there's been a couple studies when we're taking and then we try to turn it into something good and that's happened usually when we get this thing it's it's like a pile of crap that i feel like eventually we turn it into something like really useful or good but those are the times it's like those are the only times I've been in a situation where I'm like not as into the research, but I'm going through the motions because mm. I have to. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think the way I look at it um, is that you can, and somebody like a mentor said this to me early in my career, and I, I agree with him, is like, um, you know, as long as the scientist is a good, like honest scientist, which I mean, they're, it's everything. They're most scientists I, are very good, but there's like every walk of life. They're ones that are maybe more mission oriented or like cause oriented. Yeah, that's they, kind of the direction I was going with. Yeah, like, it happens. Um, like, but like, so, you know, you sometimes like whether your boss tells you to do it or like for some political reason, you have to do something in our position. Um you can't control the question all the time or where the money came from, but you can control the answer, you know, so you can answer it in a way that's honest yeah. and like the, the data supports. Yeah. Um, so that's all I, you know, personally, that's what I'm trying to do all the time. And I think that the people I work with, as I work with people who want to approach it that way mm. is that you try and figure out what the answer is going to be and like what the best thing to do with that. The most important. I mean, thing. there's results too that you can't control. Yeah, I mean, like, like the circle hook thing, going back to the circle thing. Yeah. Like, like we really, you know, the ASMFC, I think they did the right thing. They were trying to be proactive. They were like, it works for a lot of other species. We got to do something about post-release mortalities. Circle hook, like you got to use it. And then they were like, you guys have to figure out if it works or not. And we were, after the first year, we we're like, uh, not sure this works. Yeah. And they were like, and, you know, and people were like, really? And we're like, we'll do another year. Like, and we'll, we'll like try more hooks and see what happens. And it we it'd be awesome if it worked better but at the end of the day we're, we're not sitting here being like it works like because we said it was gonna work it's what like, about what about training so i'm kind of fast forwarding a step yeah. i guess but i mean you've told us like you're at the point of being able to release the release mortality data based on the last few years and the whole database but in funding and taking this all into account what about training and education like, what about when they buy their rec permit, they are required to watch X video or, you know, show competency, you know, just like we have to do when we buy our federal, you know, tuna permit for which sharks we can retain or not retain. I know I'm guessing more than half or a large percentage of the people that take that quiz just rip right through it, you know, especially if they've done it seven or eight to 10 times. But what about training and education? Yeah. What's the game plan there? Yeah, we have we have some plans there. And I, I think that um, a big question that I have personally is like, what's the most effective way? You know, is it making people take a quiz before they get their saltwater fishing permit? Is that really going to be helpful? Or are they just going to be like, bah, 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 I hit all the buttons I'm going to go through? Yeah. Um, so we do have plans. We, we It's not something we've done as much of at DMF. I think that communications... 
as a whole is something we, we're trying to be better at right now. Um, and, uh, you know, whether that's through advisory, social media, emails, stuff on YouTube, we're, we're, we're gearing up to do a lot more of that. Um, and in that vein for specifically for straight bass stuff, we're hoping this summer to film a series of videos and maybe with you guys, I'd love to talk to you about that. Um, awesome. Yeah. Doing straight bass, uh, like proper handling and release and, and trying to get people to understand that, um, so I think we'd like to do like a boat based one, maybe hopefully with you guys. Um, we're talking about doing a kayak based one and then a shore, uh, shore fishing, like surf casting based yeah. one, like three separate videos, three really distinct situations. And we're working um, with uh, with on the water to film those and get those all set up. Uh, hopefully to be shot this summer and come out maybe in the fall where we're going to have these three videos and it's going to be teaching people, but not just how to handle the fish. Cause I think this is getting to your question. Like, do you do, Right now, I'm, I'm more of the opinion. It's like rather than force people to do a thing, is like try and add value to it. So, I mean, we're going to, you guys are awesome doing the podcast and everything else. Anybody who listens to you on the podcast knows you're, you're really free with information and trying to make everybody better. Um, so, you know, like try and have the value added of like, all right, here's a rocky shoreline. The current's go, is this tide, the current's going this way. Like, really show people how to approach that situation, give them the, the, like, give them some real meat on like how to make you a better striped bass angler. Yeah. But also like, it's really important that you handle the fish this way. And when you're hooked that fish, you want to be thinking about this and like trying to accentuate yeah. those aspects of it. Totally. That's, that's, our, the, that's the my nitty plan. gritty of like, you know, how to catch them in this area, but then also what to be aware of it in regards to how they're going to eat your bait. If you're using this tactic in this area, you know, and being a more proficient angler, you know, drop back right correctly. Mm -hmm. That's what sort of I I agree with that. They gotta. It can't just be some boring video. Right. You know, they yeah. have to be able to pull something from it. Yeah, it's got to be like you guys are on. You're always thinking about how to get your lessons and your 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 stuff in front of more eyes. It's like what is going to bring people to it and make them actually pay attention. Yeah. So in talking with people like you and, and other groups like that there's a lot of people it's just oh, make a video make it like make them take a quiz i don't i don't think that's the way i think it's to get people to you know connecting a lot of dots through what we talked we're all doing this because we're really into it right mm -hmm. like that's why we're why we're Correct. sitting in this room right now and why bill and i woke up really early to beat boston traffic and get yeah. down here like and yeah. we're pumped for it so yeah, i think getting people feeding that and getting people like all right i'm going to learn something I'm, oh this is really interesting i'm going to talk to my friend about it and like that's the better way than being like, hi, the government's going to make you take a quiz. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And just one other thing. Um, so we're thinking like about like anglers like us, but um, we also have an angler ed program that Ben and I are not as involved with, although we do help once in a while, where we actually have someone based out of the Gloucester office, um, Kim Troll, and she actually runs our angler ed program. So like this Saturday, I went up to our local tackle shop, Surfland, that who we work with, and I ordered um, 200 rods that uh, are going to come in, you know, s basic, simple, like $30 rods, but we're actually going to be going out and giving those um, to the community and actually training kids on how to use them in fish and training them about fish ID and handling and all that kind of stuff. And then they actually get to keep the rod afterwards. Yeah, it's an awesome. outside grant. It's really cool. We're securing. Yeah. Yeah. So we're also working it in, in different communities too. We're all over, we've, everywhere from Fall River all the way up to the Merrimack River. We run these clinics. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. We're, and now I'm excited. Hopefully, we get this grant. We're putting that together right now yeah. because that'd be like a great tool to like try and give people everything they need. You know, like give them a day of instructional fishing. Then you're going to leave here with a tackle box full of stuff that you can use and a fishing rod, so you can go back out and keep fishing mm -hmm. yeah. rather than just having that one day of instruction and having, you know, it's not golf, it's not like hockey, it's not super duper expensive. But if you get into it, it gets expensive yeah. quick. But there's <laughs> yeah. still like a barrier. You can make it expensive. You can <laughs> very very quickly. <laughs> But, um, but you know, it's, it is like, even at the basic level, there's, there's like a cost to get in. So I think whatever we can do to like get young people and who wouldn't be fishing otherwise fishing is important. That's great. Yeah, that's, that, great that's, cause. The, that's the other aspect of it. But yeah. And then the big part about it is like, I, I personally feel like, so part of my journey to get here too, is I, I did work on a charter boat for a couple summers in Long Island Sound doing bass and bluefish. And we took out a lot of people who, you know, hadn't fished before. And hopefully we're going to fish again. Or like maybe that was like the two or three times they fished a year. Mm -hmm. They went out on a charter boat or they went out and especially like the head boat crowd. Like I, I think that charter, the charter fleet, the for hire fleet 
serves a purpose and it reaches people who aren't going to interact with that natural resource otherwise. And, you know, Bill and I like, thank you so much for giving us like the platform to talk on your podcast. It amplifies what we can say a ton, but like for the most part, we can't reach that many people. We might, we have like a small, we're always like amazed when we hear something, we're like, our little circle knows all about this. How come other people don't know about that? Yeah. Um, you guys, I mean, how many trips do you make, take? Like, how many unique a- groups of anglers do you guys have in a year? A couple hundred. Right. More so than that. It's called four four anglers per trip and 200 groups. trips. Yeah, so a yeah. couple hundred times the amount of people on the yeah. boat. Yeah. So, I mean, it's like... A like, thousand people. Yeah, you guys can touch, like, a, 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 char- a full-time charter captain can educate so many more people than we're ever going to be able to like do and and having that one-on-one education about uh, how to fish the right way to do it what's best for the resources is, is way more meaningful than even if we make the best video mm. going and watching it on youtube so I, I i am trying to get us to work a lot more with with the four hire fleet and and be interactive with you guys and listen to what you like the occurrence concerns that y'all have and try and get everybody working because at the end of the day what we want we all want is more fish in the water and a better experience for ourselves our kids our clients everybody totally that's that's the goal and i think oh i'm gonna get on my uh i'll get on my stump um i think that a lot of the times and i mean if you listen to the striped bass addendum hearing last or two weeks ago now and you hear about like four higher guys arguing with the recreational quote unquote recreational guys and everything else like i think what people really need to realize is that and you're just getting into hunting you guys are just getting into hunting you're seeing like it's a we're such even anglers now we're such a subset of the population and there's more less and less people every year who are involved with like fishing and hunting and going out and interacting with our natural resources that way but there's still everybody's resource. Like that's everybody's deer. That's what makes America great. Is that like, it's not England. It's not like that's the King's deer. You don't touch it, Brian. Yeah. How dare you shoot that beautiful yeah. 12 pointer? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, that's an atypical. Only the Lord's shoot the atypical. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, it's like, it, it, so I mean, it is it's everybody's resource. And um, I think that if we could just figure out where our, our common interests lie, whether you're a four hire, a commercial, or a recreational angler, or whatever you're, or a bow hunter or a gun hunter, and realize that the our fates really, in a lot of ways, are going to hinge on what everybody who's not doing this activity thinks about us. Mm-hmm. Like we better come to terms with that, and like a get our tent in order, and then b invite as many people as we can into that tent so they can see the value in it and again that's like what's great about like a four hire guy like you not only taking clients out but you're on a dock and maybe there's a person who has this uh, you know 25 foot sea ray who wouldn't even think about striped bass but he sees you guys and he talks to you five times a year and he's like those guys are pretty cool and they really care about striped bass and like this they told me this and so and all it takes is for them to tell a couple of people that aren't into it to understand it yeah, you know, yeah, get that no. general population knowledge base, you know, as baseline as possible, right. as consistent as possible. It's like you, you know, like you, you and your wife are into like cooking. And I, I feel like that the food aspect of what we do is an amazing avenue to get people who otherwise would not care at all about mm-hmm. it. Like when you can f- feed, a, feed somebody else who's never had deer and give them something that's like amazing. They're like, whoa, like this wait, is deer. This is deer. This is amazing. Yeah. You know, like. It They're changes, in our backyard. It, what? It changes their outlook and, and and the value that they put on not only that animal but then the habitat and everything else. Yeah. So it's a big win. So that's my my stump speech of like let's stop arguing about the details all, as much and try and figure out how to build our base and get more money and more just more concerned about our habitats because if we don't have concern for them then they're gonna go away. Mm-hmm. You know. That's a great point. Yeah. I mean. I think the charter fishing to your point's a really good way to reach a lot of people. Even like you know, going back to the video, just being able to direct a thousand people on our boats to watching that video is huge, you know, and putting more purpose behind it. And I'm excited if you I mean, if it gets down to the point of when you're filming and you need help and you need boats or whatever, I mean we're obviously more than willing to help. Yeah, that'd be great. We'll talk more off after the podcast. I mean, I have a face made for radio, but no, you, you know, <laughs> we, we get Taylor to shave. It'll be okay. Are you get, ever gonna cut that thing? Like down to skin? No, it's just there. God, now. no. Yeah, 
I I I do a, a full trim three times a year, right before fishing season, right after fishing season, and the holidays. That's it. Mm-hmm. It's been twenty three years since I saw my chin. Really? Yeah. yeah. I just can't grow on that wall. I know. Yeah. I have noticed though that one side grows way better than the other side. You know, maybe it's because you sleep on that side. Probably. So my like white patches. Yeah. Both showed up. I've had three knee surgeries, and I never had any white. And they showed up after, like, op- but like deer, opposite side, opposite side. Opposite side. I, That's I, just, weird. I, I busted my knee, <laughs> and then I got the operation. And it was my left knee first, and this one showed up. Overcompensating. And then I've done twice on my right knee. Now I have like this big white patch. That's over funny. Here. Yeah, that is funny. It's strange. I don't know. Um, he's, he's like, I don't buy it. I, I buy it. Dude, <laughs> it's my... You're going out there now. No way, man. I think it's just like the deer antlers. Oh, yep. that's too good. Yeah. yeah. Ooh, let's talk about macro really quick. Yeah, I, I have another striped bass question. Go striped bass. One yeah. more. Yeah. Um, what are your guys' thoughts on this slot? This this fun slot limit we're doing um, versus like mortality versus the slot limit having to basically go through X amount of fish to get your slot size fish versus just taking a fish. I think right now it makes sense. Yeah. Basically you have to go through 11 more fish. If the 9% is right. That's Let's what say, I was wondering. How many it, fish you got yeah, to catch? Basically you have to go like 11 more fish. Okay. Before catching a keeper, if that's what you're. And, and so one of those is dying realistically. Yes. To get to that other fish. You're killing two fish per fish. Yeah. Right. If, I mean, like the point is, that, like, do you think that 28 to 35 versus 28 to 31 meant that you this past year you had to go through 11 more fish to get your keeper? See, I have a very weird perspective just because we grew up fishing like the rivers and stuff. And we've had year after year after year of we've had to catch 50 bass to catch one keeper, mm-hmm. 60 mm-hmm. bass to catch a 28 and a quarter. Yeah. Yeah. So like looking at it in that perspective, there's years that you I wish you could just take your one, doesn't matter the size, and go fishing for something else or whatever. Um, but then there's years like last year when you're getting, you know, how many fish over thirty six inches, thirty forty inches. Like we had some days we'd we were releasing just jumbo after jumbo in the rivers. Um and you kind of wonder yourself, okay, if you could kill, you know, one per, is this ultimately hurting it a lot more than it's helping it? Yeah. Um, after seeing your age chart, it's pretty interesting, which I think is eye-opening to everybody how old these things really are. And they don't um, get as old as they used to, you know? We, yeah. They, historically, they were getting 30, 40 years old. And... Which I never realized that a 40-year-old fish was whatever it was, 45 inches. Yeah, that's you know. like a 30 year old can be like we have 45, 48 inches. Yeah, yeah, it's, crazy. Yeah. it's old. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, so if you start killing all those, you're, you're, it's tricky, you know. And I mean, I, I think that it ties into, sorry, I'll get fish nerd science for a second and maybe it'll be helpful for people who want to think about it, but like why that is important, like to be really explicit about why that's important, tying it back to so slot. slots and everything yeah. else, is that like for a lot of fish and straight bass in particular it's an environmental lottery every year they're just going to the crafts table and throwing the dice and they need a very specific set of things like there'll always be some amount of successful spawning of like eggs hatching and becoming larvae and living but in general in all fish like 99.9 percent of fish die in the first three weeks in of any year class like they're almost all that mortality like is, is like your your class set strength is what we call it. it's like how many fish will survive from that spawning event in that year is set in the first three weeks and so straight bass every time they're going to spawning there's just crap shoot right is this the year that is good um and the way you have success is by living to be 35 and being like, okay, I'm going to spawn 25 times yeah. and hopefully four or five of those are like those banger years and we're going to have a huge year. When we start fishing things down and when we go from having 35 years old fish, you know, so we have a ton of fish from six to 35. And then, so we have that, all that spread out and we always have this stable amount of big fish that so that you can weather those long 10, 15 year periods like we're in right now without a lot of good spawning. 
it works a lot better than when if you're like all of a sudden i have instead of 15 or 20 years of fish i have five or 10 years worth of a mature fish out there you can't weather longer stretches anymore that's like what's happening with atlantic herring why well, we have way less herring as you're talking about a fish that's like maxing out at five or six now and so you can go from being like one stock assessment that's every three years being like everything looks good boys to you have two years in a row of stock of recruitment failure you pull the oil in three years you're like nope you've been overfishing for two years because this thing just tanked right after our thing because we only have three age classes that are fishing so now we're already on like our last good year yeah hmm. um so that's like resiliency is what we talk about and having more fish and bigger fish is how is what really helps that so like talking about the slot right now we're really focused the last really good year the only really really good year we've had like total like top 10 year has been 2015 and right now we're just trying to get those 2015 fish through the recreational slot size and so when we put that in like everybody you guys probably saw it maybe not you guys specifically as much because you do so much tuna fishing through the fall but 2022 what happened was the beginning of that 2015 the fastest growers because again like that chart you're talking about and we can you know, maybe put that up yeah we can put it on podcast the right now. One. Yeah, yeah yeah so people can see if they want to look like just like you got anybody growing up you're like you're in third grade and there's one kid who's like two heads above everybody else and there's one kid who's two shorter like fish all grow at different speeds just yeah. like people and so you see a lot of variability at size at age um so but basically in 2022 in the second half of 22 you saw that first like the fastest growing fish from 2015 hit 28 inches mm -hmm. and all of a sudden harvest of fish went way up it doubled from what we think from all yeah. our data is it double because all of a sudden these fish that were everybody was catching 26 27 year inch fish for a couple of years and they're like can't catch a keeper can't catch a keeper like you were talking about right. the river yeah. and all of a sudden it's like oh shit like three out of five fish i catch today are, are a yeah. keeper i've been swearing too much in this podcast it's fine <laughs> this <laughs> actually that, probably been the cleanest podcast. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. i don't think i'm quite as bad as scoble yet <laughs> yeah, yeah. um the uh so so that happens right and so they went down and said all right we're going to cut it to in half. We're going to go to 28 to 31. But we also knew that it are what we were guessing and what it, the numbers seem to have bear, borne this out that we guessed correctly, the managers guessed correctly, is that, you know, just like at the end of 2022, that first half of those fish were coming into that limit. Now by 2023, those fast growers are going to be out of the 31 inch, but all the rest of those fish are going to be coming into and through that that slot limit that narrow slot limit yeah so we think we said we think there's gonna be enough of that 2015 year class so that people can still catch and harvest them without having to catch you know 10 11 12 15 more fish to get a keeper if they're after the keeper there'll still be enough fish available to make it so that they catch the keeper quickly and don't have to like just go through dozens and dozens and dozens of fish to do it so that that gambit Makes of sense. having that narrow slot would work out and the numbers suggest it did and the numbers suggested it worked i think it, it was i don't quote me on this because but I, I think it was like a 30 percent reduction in harvest to 2023 mm. so we did reduce harvest people did get to catch keepers i mean I, I it's fascinating talking to people for me i'm always whenever i go somewhere i'm trying to i ask them like how's the striper fishing because it's such a big part of my job and to hear about like the differences in where big fish were and where small fish were spatially this year was super fascinating it's interesting back to your point on like catching 10 or 11 to every slot limit keeper how many recreational average joe guys that are going to catch striped bass even catch 11 no i know in a trip so is it the charter guys really that are probably the guys going all the time that are also have the best catch and release tactics or True. should yeah you know what i mean yeah so then so i guess the percentage is probably way the percentage less. should fluctuate slash on the downside definitely like i right, we're back or right. stop fishing yeah yeah and kind of coming through you guys i mean we can go out there and try to put this information out right they're not going to believe us but it's coming through this this avenue it's, it's helpful better. it really is the perfect uh one of the most perfect ways of getting the info out there is through that something like this yeah um george we lost storage in the memory card so you're gonna have to splice this in uh we were talking about the slot slot, the slot limit slot availability beat that up a little bit. yeah beat up the slot limit it all makes sense um was awesome last year 
Yeah. So there were a lot of places without small fish. Yeah. So I did talk to a few people who had small fish all year, but it seems like the real like 25 and lower were not around. The only time I can remember last year where we got into a lot of that size class was honestly when you guys went yeah, with that, me. Yeah. Yeah. Time. We didn't see that size fish September, all the way. Yep, yeah. Mid-September is when we started to see them. Blue fish moved in. Then it was like 25 to 26 inch fish everywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, at least around us, you know, mine it to, you know, wreck some beach area. Yeah. But, um, well, this has been awesome. I know we've kind of gone around. I feel like we've, we've, for the most part, stayed on track with, uh, with the science and all the efforts that you guys have. And, um, did you want to go over macro? I do. Yeah, I think it, like macro. you guys talk about macro a lot. Yeah. And I think I like, yeah, yeah. I just have like something I want to say about it that I think will be really informative for you. It guys. all starts with the bait. So it all starts with the bait. Like abs, ab, I think that is bill bill i'm not you bill puts it best but he's basically like the great thing about bluefin fishing is you have to be good at fishing from top to bottom you have to be able to go get the bait well yeah and I, it's for me in my head way it works anyways blue catching bluefin is the pinnacle of fishing and to get to that point you have to go through this progression where you start where you're a little kid with a zebco and you got to learn how to catch those tiny little perch or or mackerel or whatever it is and like and then you know then you work your way up to like the schooly blue uh, striped bass and then you get really good at that and then you want to go get like at night you're slinging eels and now you're getting 40 50 pounders and stuff like that but in order to get to catch a tuna, a bluefin tuna, you need to go. You need to be good at all that stuff before, because if you can't go out and quickly and easily read the waters and catch bait, then you then you can't do it. And so it's like this this, this progression that I've been like I think we all have been working towards to get to. Mm. So, anyways, that's how I think of it. I, I with you. No, I agree. I also think it circles back to the basics, though. Like you build up to understanding all the intricacies to the bait and how different things work but then at the end of the day you're like they're just like striped bass it's just the rock is two miles wide and not two feet right. wide yeah you yeah. know so there's a lot of people that especially the last 10 years are rushing into tuna you know because it's like it looks i mean it's flashy you know so like luckily we didn't rush into tuna so which was awesome um but i think a lot of people are or have the money to buy the boat, to buy the gear, and they can put a pogey at 30 feet and catch a tuna, or a mackerel at 30 feet and catch a tuna. But, you know, to consistently catch them or to consistently not lose them yeah. or whatever, um, everything's going to change if we have a period of time when it's bait's hard or a tuna's hard. It's going to really weed out the people that started from kind of like you were saying, catching perch to now catching tuna versus the people that are just buying the stuff like some of these guys have barely even caught a 40 inch bass and they have tuna rods yep. yeah. and you're like you're going you're going you know you're upside down you're going backwards yeah yeah um, i to- yeah i totally you know, agree i kind of hope that one year it's kind of a grind mm. I don't because I, I, <laughs> I, I don't want to be awake till midnight catching I, pogies and Quincy I and rocking them. <laughs> Those are the good times. Those are the good times. <laughs> no, you know what I'm trying to say. No, no. Totally. Yeah. 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 But yeah, it all starts at the end of the day. It all starts with the bait. Yeah. 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 And so with mackerel, like <clears throat> I totally get it. Um, and I think that one of the things like Bill and I as fishery scientists, like our, our perspective is a little bit different than anglers is that we're always looking bigger. And we're always thinking about like really bigger, longer time scales, bigger spatial areas. And this is the macro thing is like a huge example of that, where basically, you know, from Canada down to North Carolina, the Canadian and the U.S. government are surveying macro. Like the reduction in macro is very real. They're way, 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 way less macro. They're killing the commercial fishery. They're mm-hmm. shutting it down. It just so happens that you, if you live in situate, or Gloucester, you don't, you're like, these guys don't know their butts from their elbow because I can go out to Stellwagen and catch mackerel all day long of all size classes. Mm-hmm. And if you look at the same time, they're saying there's way less mackerel, the epicenter of where mackerel are and where they spawn, where you find like the eggs, where you find the babies, like everything has shifted from south of Cape Cod into Mass Bay. And it's like gotten, so it's gotten smaller and tighter. And it's like Mass Bay is like the, you know, fortress of solitude for mackerel Hmm. so you like people wouldn't i wouldn't expect people to know that because like that's more like science nerdy assessment stuff the other thing that people 
you know, so there's a, like, we're like, we're like in the last of the good places for mackerel. So we're not seeing where everybody else doesn't have mackerel anymore. The thing that was like staring us in the face that most people don't know. And going back to some of the things we talked about with striped bass is that from 1980 to now, we've lost half of the age class there in the 1980s. We used to catch 20 year old mackerel. It's crazy. And now the oldest mackerel we catch most years, like in the surveys is six or seven years old. You wouldn't know it because they're, what do you think the size difference is between a seven year old mackerel and an 18 year old mackerel? Probably Half an inch. It's one inch. Yeah. One inch. one inch difference between a mm-hmm. seven year old and an 18 year old mackerel. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you're like, smoker like this is the one like you guys are talking about like we, we kept this thing alive for two days because this is gonna be the one that catches the fish you know like and we all get them we get those torpedoes and you're like all right man yeah. like this is gonna be awesome um but that's like we you, you think it's this giant mackerel but it's only seven years old for a fish that used to live to 20 mm. but we fished that over you know commercial fishing really we've just net we've just mowed down the age structure in that fish so it's also a fish that generally in talking about that that game of craps they hit once a decade so now we're talking about a fish. We have seven or eight years of like reproducing fish and they don't even cover like the decadal cycles in the environment that do well for them. Hmm. Right. So, and so for the commercial fishermen, they were told to go catch these fish. They weren't doing anything wrong by catching them, but it, we we're not getting the environmental, um, the recruitment success anymore for some things that's totally out of all of our control. It's just environmental. So that's also why they're not coming back. And that's yeah. why they, you know, you got that seven years and then you get that big hit is because everything finally came together environmentally to have a good year of class. And the same can be said for striped bass. I mean, right now we're, we have five years of bad recruitment, lock and loaded coming at us. And that sucks. All it would take is like two good years back to back coming out of the Chesapeake. And there's like all this stuff that's going to be, you know, the air is going to get cleared and we're all going to be okay again. So, you know, we just, right now, I think we're being very um, cautious. You have to be. Yeah. Cause we don't know. But if we could get some good year classes, if we get a cool, wet spring this year, you know, things could change quickly. Hmm. How much is the, I know everyone's talked about this with mackerel. How much is the water temperature playing a role in mackerel south of the Cape? Because there's no doubt that like warmer species of fish. I mean, guys are catching white marlin and stell wagon, which I don't think has ever happened. Maybe before yeah. my lifetime, I've never heard of it, but they were catching them in stell wagon. What was it? Three... The, the year COVID, right? Mm-hmm. Three years, four years ago? Or even just the Bonita, the Bonitas Bonita. that we're seeing and the... Sea bass. Pilot fish and sea bass and, you know, all that sort of thing. So, yeah, like, how much of before. that, even if it's a couple degrees in temperature, I'm sure it's... It's definitely a factor for straight bass. Um, it's got to be a factor for mackerel, right? Probably is, but the, the thing about mackerel is that um, it's contracting from the north, too. So there might be an environmental thing. There is often a lot of things working in concert, but we're seeing that the northern range is like the that density is shrinking too. Mm. So it's both the the amount of fish or the, the, the age class. The amount of the fish. fish. The, the of fish. yeah, the amount of fish. I is thought shrinking. Canada they think it's like the more they've ever, most they've ever seen. Really? Isn't it? I mean, my understanding that's of the Canadian what I understand. Is, and th- that's where it goes back and forth of what you're visually seeing and what you know right. the data yeah. is showing. In my experience, I went from. In the same time frame, actually. So when I was in Canada, end of September and early October last year, and then... This is where you're going to find interesting. Simultaneous. So let me back up. All summer, crazy, crazy amounts of mackerel in the Big bank. sizes. Big, big sizes, sizes, small sizes. Saw way more small inshore mackerel in the inside ledges this year than we did actually the year before. Correct yeah. me if I'm wrong. Oh, yeah. Um, and then we were fishing nice baits on fishing on good bait on big schools of bait and we're fishing awesome hook baits all summer Mm -hmm. then we get to mid-september we got a two 48 hour northeast blow and all of our bait changes on the bank like overnight and that same system hit just offshore of uh like atlantic side nova scotia pei and their bait also switched instantly changed the quantity was there but the size instantly changed it was like you know a hook bait was like a six inch bait five inch bait you know seven inch bait and it was we were talking nightly yeah and it was the exact same the exact same thing macro rafts odd 600 pounder on each macro raft you could tell when that macro raft was getting attacked and just like as far as you could see especially on calm you know calm sea days 
Makarov, 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 tide change, tunas would come in and eat on them. And we so we were seeing the exact same thing no as one the knew bird flies 700 miles away. Yeah. It was yeah. crazy. And no one knew, and even the commercial mackerel guys were struggling to find the big mackerels. And yeah. then some weather patterns changed, some water November changed. All... December was like the best bait we've ever we've seen. It's all giant mackerel and giant herring, and they're staying longer. So it's like, and you guys, I mean, we're speaking to the choir. Yeah. You guys know, <laughs> right? So like, that's the thing that's, like, I understand the age class part of this, but I still... You know, there, there there has to be this giant question mark. And I know it's in your guys' head too. Are, are we just searching the wrong waters? You know, are they just outside of where we are? Are they more inside of where we're studying them? Are they... Or are, are they I mean? just more dense in a smaller area? Right. You know, and yeah, the year class thing is 100% on, but they're more dense now in a smaller area because of environmental factors. I mean... It's weird. A well-designed survey should capture that. Like yeah. I've run trawl surveys for cod and stuff. I haven't done the acoustic surveys for mackerel, but and I, I understand it's a good survey, and so it should capture that. They should have some type of biomass estimate um, relative about what they're seeing when they're recording mackerel, and then the spatial distribution that should also be well captured. Mm -hmm. So I don't think they're hiding someplace. I think the assessment's real. Yeah, um, but. When we start talking about movements and stuff like that, that's like maybe that's like Ben and I keep doing stuff like we love to do. I can't explain why that happened. I saw it. Yeah. Those mackerel rafts were awesome to fish around. But if you did the study during that time, you'd be like, "There's zero big mackerel." You know um, what I mean? That's that's the thing that becomes tricky. Right? Yeah, and that's yeah. what comes to the survey design to be like you want it when we're doing it. We're trying to you know, act on what we know and right. capture a long enough period. You, like the way you might want to think about it is if you have an event, whenever we're like trying to capture an event, we're trying to get the zeros on both ends. Mm -hmm. You know, we want right. to start early enough so we capture it and end after it ends. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, like that's what we're trying to do. So if you have a well-designed survey, it's supposed to be trying to capture all those changes that happen over a period of time and come up with an accurate you know it may be bigger error bars or smaller error bars but like an accurate do you, do you guys think that idea and this this and there's a whole podcast in itself but like brian and i sat in some of those macro meetings and seeing like the information and stuff that's that was given and some of it looked like totally barbaric like horrible ways again information do you think that the surveys that we've done when you think it's poor recruitment like are real like obtain correct correctly type surveys and like i know i'm kind of putting you on the spot but like do you think our surveys have been good enough to actually think this or do you think we we, we have should, room to improve do we have room for to improve so we can get there's always room for real yeah, information room for always, always yeah. room for improvement. Yeah. yeah yeah but i mean we know people that have um worked on the assessment and they evaluated it and and they have confidence in it. And yeah. so although I didn't sit in those meetings and I didn't look at the mackerel survey, um, I can go by what my colleagues have said and they, they do believe in it and they do think it's, yeah. it's good numbers. I mean, we, you know, a lot of like the age structures, the stuff, the port sampling, the sea sampling, where I started at the core of my career, I mean, that's what we do. We go out and we collect this age data and so it can be properly assessed. And um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm gonna stand by the data yeah. yeah. So I do think it's it's probably right, as much as I hate to admit it. Yeah. Yeah. It stinks. Mm -hmm. And I think that one. I mean, in my new job, it's I, I, I think it's like seventy five percent of my time now. Instead of thinking about the cool stuff we're talking about, I'm thinking about communication. So I think like so much of it is that a lot of scientists have a really hard time communicating to anglers and to stakeholders properly. And that's something we could like, that's a definite area for improvement to try and get people to understand in plain language in relatable ways, mm. like what's going on. Mm. Yeah. I mean, cause this stuff's complicated. It's, it's super it's, complicated it's, it's, for everybody, for us, it's, it's complicated. And you know, you're trying to count something that you can't see, like you're going, you're running through the forest blind, trying to count trees basically. Yeah. And so there's obviously techniques to do that, but it's, it's very difficult. And then to relay that a lot of this is like deep math, statistical stuff to the average guy that doesn't know, understand that stuff. It's hard. Yep. It's never going to be perfect. 
<laughs> and you just have to collaborate as much as possible. Oh, but always try and make you it know. better, man. Yeah, always oh, yeah. try and make it always better. improving. Yeah, always yeah. learning, always improving. Yeah, that's what you got to aim for. That's um, the fun part. I'm interested to see where it goes in the next ten years. I am too. Yeah, I'm interested to see what we see for tuna fishing in the next ten years. If it's just going to be on this, I hope we see more herring. Like. I mean, we haven't been doing it as long as some of the guys we've learned from and... And people that are listening. People that are listening, but, I mean, the last 13 years, it's just been like... It's... it's Every year it gets better. Yeah. I, I'm waiting for it to go the other way, but it doesn't. I know. Oh. I know. I remember I would go summers and I would, like, only mark a couple fish. Mm. Yeah, the first and, summer yeah. or two I fished with you. And... Yeah, we didn't mark... Sh- that's, that's, thing. <laughs> that's one thing that I wish, you know maybe you guys can help with but we there has to be a way to market to the general public that bluefin are increasing as far as like because like for instance tiktok like we'll post a video on tiktok of like you know catching a fish harpooning a fish whatever fish we're pulling the fish in and like 90 percent of the comments are like they're endangered because I mean, they read, yeah, I, I went they read the, on Google that they're endangered. I mean, I went to what? the aquarium with my kids a couple weeks ago. They say they're and, endangered. And they still have like, I mean, it's not that there's... They I mean, have a whole wall on the first floor yeah, over no, on the no, left-hand no, side I don't think that's like in. an active decision. It's yeah. a display they right. made 10 years ago yeah. that they haven't updated. and it's, yeah. it, But it's still like, I'm sitting here like, that's not actually right. true. Or even Wicked Tuna, they still have that thing saying still since the 1950s, they're yeah. killing one tuna at a time. It's like, yeah. come on. Get um, over it already. Yeah, and so, I mean, I think that there's... I, I've had a lot... Even before I got tar- started with bluefin fishing, um, I've, I've had opinions about this, but I, I... At the end of the day, I heard you guys talking about this with uh, Captain Sacco on your last podcast. I, I, I've always been like, if if the commercial fishery wants a better market for bluefin, that the only people that are going to do that for them are... They are the only ones. So I think that there needs to be somebody... Or some group of people within the commercial fishery that's like, let's get serious about this. And I think you see that across a lot of commercial fisheries where guys are just wanting, people are commercial anglers because they want to, or fishermen because they want to go out and fish. They want to be commercial fishermen. They don't want to deal with the port stuff. Yeah. They do it, but they don't want to. But there's got to be somebody out there or some group of people out there who are going to drive the domestic, drive the domestic market to be like, I am going to get, you know, David Chang to come out. And go on a bluefin trip, and we're gonna like have a whole TV show on Netflix. You yeah. know, like one of the episode is like all about sustainable American line caught bluefin tuna, and like and then like the awesome food you can make out of it. I just think you know, I hundred like, percent agree that like that the commercial fishermen, the guy, whatever, need to push that. But I just don't see the country accepting that narrative on bluefin with how built up. This whole endangered thing. I know the it's answer. Terrible. You want to hear the answer? What? Joe Rogan's podcast. <laughs> oh no, <laughs> I know. that's the only answer. I just something that that of epic proportions honestly has to happen. It's just I feel to like open people's there's eyes. There's this stigma around that species. Yeah. There's just this stigma around it that the top dollar restaurant in the city of Boston still just doesn't want to have it on the menu, or it should be on every restaurant's menu in Boston. Every seafood restaurant in Boston should have bluefin tuna on there. And it's not. Yeah. It's right. on a select Even handful. the sushi places don't yeah. advertise it as bluefin because yeah. they're scared. Yeah. I mean, I, I, it'd be nice for that to happen. But I'm always, I'm definitely like, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? It's like, if you don't, you, if you sit around, I think if we sit around or, I mean, I, it's something I would never be involved with because it's like such a direct conflict of interest. But like, I think that the community, if they sit around waiting for like the Joe Rogan moment or some other like equivalent landslide moment, it's not going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like get working and come up with a plan to turn that tide and it's going to take years and it's going to take effort, but I think it can and should be done because it's like a sustain, it's being sustainably fished. It's an awesome fish. It yields a ton of a ton of meat. A ton of it's meat. a healthy it, stock. Yeah, yeah, it's a healthy stock. Like like, there's no reason that we shouldn't be utilizing it. And it's like a pretty. It's not you know. It's not like we're out there killing whales or like there's. We don't have fixed gear. We're not using indiscriminate gear when it comes to sizes. It's a selective. Like, it's a very selective fishery. It's sustainable. It's local. Like these are when you think about it, again going to like food being an entryway into these things like. 
it hits so many of those points that like people should be like, that's a good thing. Yeah. Right. Yep. Like, I mean, so, it's being caught by owner operated business, private guys going out catching stuff. And when, when I sell a fish and I, it doesn't go, I mean, yes, it's always nice getting the big score if it goes to Japan, but when it doesn't go and it goes, stays domestic, I'm always like, cool. Because I just saved all that fuel and ex all, you know, crazy expense getting it to Japan overnight and stuff like that, where it stays domestic. We're keeping all that in in states, keeping it local, You're feeding right. your own country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, we should be. Yeah, that would, that makes. I, I love one. So Joe Rogan, if you are listening to this podcast, <laughs> okay. on. kidding, but not really kidding. <laughs> uh, Come bluefin tuna fishing, see what yeah. it's all about, and start eating it. Uh, yeah. So. Um, well, guys, I know we we talked about a lot. Um, this was awesome. We, we learned a again. ton. It was great to recap what we all did over the summer. Eye-opening for us in a lot of ways, I think. Mm. Um, we appreciate your efforts. I mean, it's not it's not an easy job, I would say, from multiple different viewpoints. Yeah. It's fun. I, yeah, we're like we're I I would say thank you to you guys because I mean, at the end of the day, like I I I think both of us take our job. We're public servants, right? Like we are partially paid by taxpayer money. You know, we're, and it's depending on what's going on. Like for a long time, I was paid purely by um, marine license sales. Mm. In my new job, I'm not. But for my first 10 years, I was. So it's like really much like anglers and taxpayers are paying us. We're working with a public resource. It's a real privilege. Like we get yeah. to do some really amazing stuff and generally feel good about it at the end of the day because hopefully we're making it like a little bit better of a world for all of us mm -hmm. and all our kids. So Yeah. Yeah. And thanks a lot for having be. us here and yeah. spend the time with us. And we've listened to your podcast. We're, we're definitely fans, but, um, you know, we like, we like what you guys do too. And so and it's nice to be able to share this, what we're into with your listeners. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's, it's awesome to see how passionate you guys are about it. It's, 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 it's not yeah. healthy. As soon as, the, <laughs> as soon as they walked into the house, it was just like full on fish stories and hunting stories. So, Yep. Yeah. It's great. Thank you guys. Yeah. Thank yeah. you guys. Um, as far as info website, all that, I know you stated it a couple of times, but just to kind of recap a little bit, maybe we're working on our website. Um, it's a lot of work. It's, we have certain ways we have to construct our state website. So please yeah. look around and try and find <laughs> the fun stuff. Uh, but, uh, if you want to get into the striped bass work that Bill and I were talking about mass.gov forward slash striper, is the best way and and we have that laid out pretty well so that it can get you wherever you want to go if it has to do with striped bass yeah and, and if you're interested in helping out um go there and sign up for the citizen science um, data collection study that we have that going into year two we're gonna have some great prizes and stuff if you send in data you get a nice pair of fishing pliers after your first report um, every other week, we're going to be sending out a free fishing rod. Um, last year, uh, Costa supported us, so hopefully that will come back around again so we can send out um, sunglasses. And um, But more importantly, um, love to see what you guys are catching and, and what you're catching it on. Yeah, and, That'd the, be a big help. Yeah, and the data is a huge help. It's going to go to you know understanding what's going on with straight bass mortality better, solving a, one of the weak parts of the assessment. So it's going to help everybody. That's great. Cool. Well, thank you guys for your efforts. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks for coming down. Uh, we'll end this on our dad's three words of fishing wisdom. Remember, you can't catch them if you don't have a hook in the water. Always trust your instincts. And the last one, you'll have to keep listening. Stay tight, everybody. Thank you very much for tuning in to the Seabros Fishing Podcast. If you would like more information about today's guest, our episode, and show sponsors, or if you want to order hats and apparel, please visit our website at seabrosfishing.com. You can also stay up to date in all the latest Seabros fishing content and podcast episodes by following us on Instagram at Seabros Fishing. Finally, to book a trip with us through our family-run charter fishing company, please visit MassBayGuides.com or see our latest updates and fishing reports by following MassBayGuides on Instagram and Facebook.